So this program was recorded on Monday, October the 15th, in the year of our Lord, 2018. The opinions expressed by the participants in the following program do not necessarily represent that of this station or its management. Or anybody else. <laughs> That's right. From the John DeVita Recording Studio, located in an undisclosed and clandestine location on the great northwest side of our fair city of Chicago, we once again are pleased to be presenting yet another edition of our monthly roundtable panel discussion show, Meet the Chicago Historian. Now here's the guy who started it all, John DeVita. Yeah. Hey. Well, th well, thank you very much, Rich. From the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Meet the Chicago Historians on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, October the 15th, the year 2018. Today, the panel will be talking about Chicago Championships, the World Series, the Super Bowl, the NBA, the Stanley Cup, the NCAA, and, of course, much, much more. So sit back and enjoy Meet the Chicago Historians. And now to start today's broadcast, here's our announcer, Mr. Richard Lang. And now here's today's panel moderator, John Kuchelko. Thank you very John. much. Thank you very much, Rich. And it's a pleasure to be here with you at the John DeVita Broadcast Center once again as I... Don't look for us, folks. We're deep underground. We're not. You have to go through so many checkpoints and barbed wire and everything. It's a heavily defended post. But we're here underground, and we're about to do uh, another venture into uh, reviewing the news of the day, the week, and the month, which we do once a month. And we're glad to have you with us for our October edition. This is our autumn version of Meet the Chicago Historians. Fall has begun, and, and coming down today, it, it's one of those first days when it really seems like fall. The weather is really telling you that summer has finally come to an end here in the Chicago metropolitan area. We had an extended summer all through September and even into early October. It was 80 degrees last Tuesday, I believe. It was mm -hmm. 80 degrees outside. The weather's been beautiful, but I noticed the trees are finally beginning to change. One of the One of the... Uh, interesting facts is uh, in recent weeks, it was amazing that the trees were still green all through September. You drive, I was out in the country a few times, and seeing that, that the dark green of the trees that late in the season was amazing. Probably, it must be due to the, the temperature and the amount of rain that we had, but I noticed driving in today that uh, all through Oak Park and some of the areas which I drove through, the trees are finally showing the fall color. So if you're a fall color enthusiast, this coming weekend is probably the good weekend to get out and look for it because uh, uh, autumn is here and it's we're, we're going to be seeing even colder weather ahead and Halloween is not far behind. Well, we have a fine panel and of course I should say that our regular moderator, Jack Red, it's not his politics, <laughs> Ryan, uh, cannot be here with us today. Uh, Jack Ryan is our regular moderator. Uh, but he has uh, commitments at home that prevent him from being here today. So I'll be your, your fill-in host, your guest moderator. And I'd like to give uh, the other members of our stalwart panel an opportunity to introduce themselves. I'll begin to my left with our announcer. Let's hear from our announcer. Yes, I am indeed your announcer, Rich Lang. I've got a background in teaching American and European history at the college level mainly 19th and 20th century modern American and European history. Got that in my background. And more recently, thanks to Ken Little, I've become more and more familiar and interested in Chicago neighborhood history, mm. ethnic changes in the neighborhoods. It's fascinating, a whole store of treasure about that sort of thing. And I am also involved in a group that recreates, some of you may, re may remember this, old-time radio shows like uh, the Vickersons, Jack Benny, Fred Allen, Fubringi, and Molly. That's another one of my fun sidelines, too. 
Thank you, everybody. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's our that's our, our great announcer, Rich Lang. Now, to my right, and I say that geographically because <laughs> I always I always say that there is no one in America t- to the right of me politically. <laughs> but uh, to my right is one of the gentlemen who I believe is the only one, certainly only one of the four of us, who is one of the founding members of our Meet the Hi- Chicago Historians panel. So let's hear from that fine Gentlemen seating, seated to my right, would you please introduce yourself? Bill Kugelman, and uh, you sure make me feel old. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't my intention. That, John. <laughs> that wasn't my intention. <laughs> we, yeah, we started cop talk, and, uh, you know, it went on from there. But, uh, uh, yes, I, uh, I'm retired from the Chicago Fire Department after 46 years and uh, uh, a lot of weather, hot and cold. Today, though, is uh, is the start of autumn. In fact, I think it's the start of fall. I don't think these leaves are going to be on the trees for very long uh, after the last few days. But uh, sure is better than this uh, humidity and the heat that we had here for a while. Much, much better. Uh, and to my right is uh, our new... Newest member, I guess. Let's hear from our the new member of our panel. Well, thank you, John. So I am the newbie, uh, as you mentioned, Bill. Uh, I'm Dennis Fitzgerald. I'm a retired Chicago policeman of 33 <coughs> years, and I'm uh, approaching my 18th year of retirement, and uh, and it's a good time. And uh, I'm uh, honored and uh, glad to be uh, part of the panel, uh, invited to the uh, radio station here in this clandestine location. I must tell you, in my retirement, I find, uh, you know, we all think that we know what we're going to do and what's in store for us, but frequently we're surprised, as I was uh, with my involvement with the police council, Knights of Columbus. Pretty unique that it is, in that our members come from all segments of law enforcement, city, county, state, and federal, and uh, all th- in from the entire law enforcement family. We have attorneys, state's attorneys, judges, chiefs of police, so it's pretty unique. And be assured we take pride in, in uh, uh, one of our members who was, uh, or were, were honored, I should say it this way, uh, that he was a member for 19 years. It was Paul Bauer, oh, who in year. recent oh, times yeah. was killed back in uh, sure. uh, tragic death uh, back February 13th uh, in downtown Chicago, broad daylight. Uh, so he's a 19-year member of our 20-year-old council, and uh, and uh, so this was in store for me to head up this council, uh, unbeknown to me, but I was asked to step up, and uh, so I find myself in a 12-month recruitment mode, John, and uh, I just had to say those few words about it. That's right. So I'm honored to be here today. I'm a, I am also, I'm a brother knight of Columbus. I'm, oh. a, I'm a fourth degree knight of Columbus. Oh. And uh, I, I, you don't have a name, though. Your council doesn't. Uh, yes, we do. Oh, yes, we do. do. I was sure. going to ask what the name was. Uh, thank you. you. So we're St. Uh, uh, Michael the Archangel Council, oh. 12173. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Knights of Columbus is 135 years old, and that is 1882 vintage. And they've acquired uh, in excess of 15,000 councils. And I should tell you that 98% of these councils all emanate from a parish. That's a traditional uh, structure. Mm -hmm. So a physical parish with a geographical boundary, a parish with a physical church, a physical rectory, but we don't have any of that. Our chaplain is the police chaplain, Father Dan Brandt. And as he ministers to active policemen and their families, and retired policemen and their families, well, that's our following. And retired policemen frequently relocate. When they retire and pull the pin, they relocate. So in reality, we find that our members come from approaching 50-some-odd suburbs around Chicago, far north to far south, and as far west as Yorkville, about an hour and 15 minutes out. So we're pretty unique. Uh, uh, We're the only law enforcement council, having been sanctioned and chartered 20 years ago. And at that time, the Supreme Knight, who is still in office, Carl Anderson. He came here and ever so proud that he was to sanction us, and we in turn gave him a Chicago police uniform, (laughs) which he promptly and directly installed in the International Museum in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, so we're one of a kind. We take pride in that. And in our small council, 
We have in excess of 4,000 years of law enforcement experience. Now, that in itself is a jaw-dropper. So uh, I have to put that plug in whenever I get the chance, and thank you for uh, allowing me my words. Thank you very much. And, and let, me, uh, let me continue on that is that when uh, uh, I got the idea of the Knights of Columbus, of which I joined when I was in college up at Marquette University, uh, and then uh, uh, out in Arlington Heights, and now uh, I figured we need one here in the Chicago Fire Department. So I, uh, with, with uh, Dennis's uh, predecessor, uh, Mike uh, Schumacher, who was the Grand Knight? Uh, I uh, I picked up a few a few ideas, and uh, one of them uh, was when I started Saint. Uh, uh, well, uh, I just bet you that nobody knows who the Saint is of the fire department. Name is Florian. Saint Florian. Saint That's Florian. Florian. Yeah, I have seen that. Yeah. Yes, yes, and and yes. we yeah we had a big yes. a big to do about naming uh, our council. Uh, but the big thing was uh, w they are 12, uh, what is it, uh, Dennis? 12173 is our council one, number. Yeah. Yeah. And our council number is 12911. And uh, I had a fight to get that number. Very good. Uh, mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to Mr. Anderson. Uh, when, he, uh, when they came in, and uh, we, got, we get together quite often, uh, uh, St. Michael's and St. Florian's, we are the only police council and fire council in the whole organization. I'm surprised. I, was th I would think New York, for example, you would think that no. New York would have one, or Boston. You would think that that idea would have originated. Why it never well, came about, John, I don't, I don't know. know. I, I, I see your judgment there. The, the, the organization began on the East Coast, New Haven, right. Connecticut. Right, yes. In, Connecticut. in 135 years, you think yeah. it would have transpired. Yeah. 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 Somebody no. would have, but... Uh, yeah. No, we uh, we uh, uh, you know came a long way <laughs> when uh, Anderson came into town to uh, give us St. Florian's and then uh, St. Michael's. I, I he had something for them too. Uh, they flew in by United Airlines and uh, a freebie, of course. And uh, <laughs> everything is pro bono with them. Uh, they uh, they came into uh, O'Hare. And uh, being, of course, uh, chief on the fire department, I called there, and I said, I want you guys, the, the fire uh, unit, I want you guys to go on out and give them the water salute. Hmm. And uh, they did. And uh, it was a nice day. You know, nobody was hurt. Uh, but the, the, uh, after meeting Anderson, the pilots came off and uh, came down the runway and... and uh, met us and and uh he said uh who who did that who who you know ordered this water salute and i said i did i said why did it, you know does it bother you or that he says no he says but uh you know that's one of the things that we pilots do on our last on our last flight before we retire we get a water salute he says, and I thought they were telling me something. Well. They, didn't, <laughs> they didn't want me to do it. Very oh, good. Yeah, yes, the yeah. voice about that. Yeah. yeah. John, if I could, uh, yeah. I, I forgot to say before, should anybody want to get in touch with us, oh, our email address is policecouncil at gmail.com. Policecouncil at gmail.com. Or, it's kind of lengthy, Chicago Police Department KC at gmail.com Chicago Police Department KC at uh, gmail.com um, Earlier today, prior to our broadcast, I had occasion to extend an invitation to an old friend of the station here, Bill Jackinetti, who I used to work with many years ago. And Bill and I talked for probably about a half an hour in John's basement here, John DeVita's basement, and uh, I extended an invitation Bill Giaconini was surprised that so many people that he knew are members of our council. And uh, so I look forward to him joining our ranks uh, and being part of this unique organization. Well, so. thank you very much, and thanks for telling us about the KCs. They were founded 
in the 19th century by a priest named Father Michael McGivney, yes. who is the, the patron of the Knights of Columbus. They are a large, well-respected organization. But I must tell you that uh, I'm one of those that is not happy with the decision that has been made to change the uniform of oh, the, of the fourth right. degree, the color guard, the color corps of the of the Knights of Columbus, and if you've ever watched the Columbus Day Parade in particular, or you've seen them in your own parish or at some other Catholic function, you've seen them with their, their black capes and their plumed naval style, the old type of Admiral's Chapeau. Uh, in fact, they're called a Chapeau by the KCs, yeah. and with the sabers, and, and the, uh, in their lack of wisdom, the, uh, the leaders of the, the KFC have decided to change to what they consider a more modern uniform, which I, with which I am spectacularly <coughs> unimpressed. Yes, and I, I understand agree that with there you. are many that feel exactly the You're same. You're right, way and as there I are got. there are petitions afoot, and uh, we'll see uh, just what they can accomplish. But that traditional uh, cape, chapeau, and saber, uh, we are so recognizable, and uh, it was an attention getter, and right. people were just exactly. so surprised mm -hmm. as we marched in parades. And we do that annually in the police department, the, the law enforcement family, with the St. Jude Parade on the lakefront, and we in, we invite other councils and assemblies to march with us. Uh, and uh, as we, uh, of course, uh, once again at the Paul Bauer funeral, we had the honor guard there. And that I've been a member of the fourth degree honor guard since 1980. Uh, right after the Pope came to Chicago. And uh, I would hate to see that uniform fall by the wayside. I did buy the new uniform, but I hope I never have to wear it. Well, I would say uh -huh. that, that, that going to this new uniform is about the most brilliant marketing decision since New Coke. <laughs> if, you're, if you remember when the Coca-Cola <laughs> company oh, decided to change the formula <laughs> of the most successful soft drink of all time <laughs> and came out with what they called New Coke. I think it's gone. I think yeah. for a while there was New Coke and Classic Coke. I think New Coke just disappeared yeah, and I they just went right. back. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. what is today Coke is once again Classic Coke. <laughs> but uh, sometimes corporations and others make these boneheaded decisions and uh, it's just such a recognizable part of the KC's. People are familiar with it. They've seen them in parades and at public events. And it just seems to me to be just mindless. And, and the uniform they selected is just, it's nothing. It's, it's, uh, it's spectacularly unimpressive. Unimpressive. No one that's is going to notice it or, or, or remember it. That's uh, correct. Maybe they could give us a longer wear out period. Or, or tolerate the two uniforms. Or have the two. Have, have, have the, the two. One, one be sort of the full dress uniform. And Good you idea, could, You can have the lesser uniform for, for less, lesser occasions or something. Quite well like made, sure. The way the military has, you know, full dress and... There are the levels of uniforms that the military have. For, yes, for very for good suggestions. Yes. Well, we've uh, we've heard from now one, two, three, four of the five folks here, and, and not counting our our uh, producer in the control room. Uh, but we have one other member of the panel who joined us just a few moments after we got underway. So I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Don Peter. Uh, I've been here a little bit. I seem like a, a kid compared to the rest of these gentlemen, but. Uh, I retired from downtown Oak Park Merchant Association, and I'm a volunteer at the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago. Oh. Glad that you brought that up, uh, Don. Yeah. I, I don't mean to uh, interrupt you, but you mentioned the Fire Museum. We have an open house uh, hmm. the 27th of uh, October, and uh, it is at 5218 Southwestern. Uh, everybody is welcome. And uh, admission, of course, is free, and we're open from uh, 10 until 2. So if you uh, have kids, bring them along. They can sit on the fire trucks and take their picture and uh, see the history of the Chicago Fire Department. And that, along that lines, they're about to acquire uh, former Engine 59 from Chicago that's been sitting up in Milwaukee probably for 50 years. Oh, and really? That, and that was one of the engines. Must be a very old piece then. It's a 20... Oh. S early something. And it was destroyed in the stockyard fire and hmm. completely rebuilt. And now it's literally a rusting hulk. Yeah, what a history. So it's just sitting out in the in a field somewhere? It was in a warehouse with a, a big warehouse. hole in the roof. Yeah. Well, just, yeah. Which is just as bad as being <laughs> in a field. So they're gonna. Has, so it's gonna take an effort then to restore this. And I uh, don't think they're gonna restore it. I think oh. they're gonna use it as a donor. It's 
it's almost beyond restoring. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. all there, yeah. but so what's the point of what? what it's is totally rusty. For what are they going to use it? Probably for parts. It's just show mm -hmm. parts. For shows, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a uh, Aaron's Fox. Oh yeah, and yeah. I had the bright idea of putting that one behind the one that's in the museum, the Alpha and the Omega kind of the deal. But uh, I don't think they'll do it. Matter of fact, I know they won't do it. It would cost too much to, to even even to just to repair the external. Even if it couldn't dry, but no. you couldn't just repair the facade of it so that mm. it could be a museum piece. It, it would be a dark hole for money. Ah, uh, yeah, uh. that's a shame. That's unfortunate. I mean, I mean there are probably there are probably many vehicles through the years though that have been long good. You know, cars that would today be historic. You know, that were just left out in a in a field somewhere right, in the right. in the middle of nowhere and then just rusted away to nothing. Right. And, uh, it's one of my pet peeves that. Uh, I'm involved. I, I contribute to an organization called the Commemorative Air Force uh, that maintains uh, uh, classic aircraft, particularly from World War II. And it's amazing when you see how many thousands and thousands of these various types of planes were produced during the war and how few of them remain. Right. There are only, for example, the, the, I think that we produced close to 10,000 B-29s during World War II. It was the greatest bomber of all time. It was the bomber that carried the atomic bombs to the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but did conventional bombing of Japan as well. And I th there were eight or nine, close to 10,000 produced. There are only two flying B-29s today. There are only, only two of two. them. Yeah. Only mm -hmm. two that are airworthy, as they say. Now, there are others in museums uh, hanging, you know, at the Smithsonian. Uh, uh, they have the Enola Gay, which I don't think is, is yet on full display, but the, uh, the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, has a B-29. In fact, right. they have Boxcar, which is the plane that delivered the second atomic bomb, right. the, the Boxcar. It's not spelled like a railroad boxcar. It's Bock, B-O-C-K apostrophe S, Boxcar, because the commanding officer was a man named uh, Bock. Uh, mm -hmm. But they have the plane that dropped the second atom bomb on Nagasaki on display at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, which is in a huge, you know, a huge right. hangar. It's not out in open air. Right along with a B-36, which was an even larger piston engine bomber. But the point I'm making is that the Air Force didn't, didn't preserve. I often wonder why they didn't put aside 50 of these planes or 100 of them and take care of them so mm -hmm. that in later years when they would, when they would be uh, you know, a part of history, they would be available because they were just allowed to just rust away. Mm -hmm. They were used as targets. Right. They were they were uh, you know treated very badly the P fifty ones and the P forty sevens and the P th all these classic the P thirty eight and there are very few of them and the the purpose of this commemorative air force is to preserve those planes right. and to fly them that they're not mm -hmm. just they're not just museum pieces but they fly and they fly yeah. to air shows right. and people can actually see them mm -hmm. as they as they appeared over the skies of Europe mm -hmm. and Japan in the 1940s. Or use them in period uh, motion pictures. I'm sure, and I'm right. sure probably, Documentaries, yeah. I would imagine yeah. they uh -huh. probably are available for sure. that. Now, because is that the successor to the Confederate Air Force? It actually, I think it is the same organization that was for many years okay. known, and it was founded as the well, Confederate Air Force. They were Texans, I believe it was right. founded in Texas right. by a group of Texans in the 1960s. Hmm. And they called it the Confederate Air Force. And uh, in recent years, I think given the... Uh, changing attitude toward the toward right. the so-called confederacy and its emblems and insignia they uh, and i think wisely decided to, to right. change the name to the commemorative era it never made sense to me <laughs> when i see why they called yeah. it the confederate era I, I well i i, I understand yeah. what the point they were trying to make but right. uh, they were southerners and they were they were proud of their heritage but uh, yeah, uh the confederacy is a mixed bag if and, i'm uh, not mistaken i think they will weather their aircraft down in central Florida. Right, yeah. Kermit the, Weeks has the right. Fantasy of Flight Museum. Mm -hmm. And the last time I talked to him, he had a B-29 being restored in Europe. That would be the third. Which he was <coughs> going to fly back here. And he built a, uh, a Air Force hangar just for that aircraft because it was so big. The, the commemorative Air Force has a B-29 called Fifi. Uh, in fact, for one of my contributions, maybe next time I'll bring. I, I got a cap with a with with, a, mm, and yeah. with a, a B twenty nine uh, embroidered on the on the on the cap and the name Fifi, and there is now a second one. For a while, that was the only flying B twenty nine, but now another one has been restored called Doc, 
from the the dock of the uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. They got okay. a, got a, a nose uh, a nose figure of Doc from the from the Disney cartoon. Uh, so there are now two flying B twenty nines in the world. So if, if, if you know that if another one, that would make three of them. That right. Will be and did one of them? They had it restored somewhere. There was in one the north. They found one in Greenland. They found right. a B twenty nine that had crashed during the war or just after the war in Greenland and had been preserved in the ice. Right. And they spent a fortune repairing it and I th- it just when they were about to to finally fly it it crashed something caught happened fire. Or it caught fire and it burned to the ground and just completely destroyed it to the <laughs> point where it was beyond repair. Right. And they were just at the threshold of of getting it in the air I think was the next right. step. And uh, they had a documentary on channel 11 yeah. about that. Right. So that that was re- I mean that was that was really tragic to lose. Did, it didn't didn't they just uh, pull a plane out of the uh, Lake Michigan? I heard something somewhere. About it. Yes. Yeah, it was oh, a fighter there's, plane. There's they said they documented about seventy of them yeah. because they were they were practicing yeah, aircraft well. landing and they would right. go into the right. lake. The Wolverine. Wolverine and there was another one. Airsats aircraft. That was a ship. Yeah. Had, yeah, and they were paddle wheel aircraft carriers. <coughs> yeah, but uh, the government is laid claim to them saying there's still government property. And I think the one at O'Hare and the one at Midway were restored from the well, bottom had, of the ocean. They have? I, I wasn't aware of that. They, were they have historic they were planes at, at, at O'Hare? I think they do. I didn't know Billy that. Billy O'Hare and then at Midway, I can't remember mm. who it was. It was a politician's son or something like that that got killed. And he's at, or maybe it's from commemorates the, the ma- the Battle of Midway. And that's a, that's an interesting point because we were we were supposed to talk about Chicago history. And I wonder, there are probably people. I'm sure there are people who are unaware of the meanings of of the name Midway and O'Hare. They're both World War II uh, originated right. terms because Midway commemorates the Great Battle of Midway, the turning point of the Pacific War at the beginning of June 1942 when four of the six carriers that had attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor were sent to the bottom, uh, Very three of them within a matter of minutes uh, at the Battle of Midway right. by, um, by American bombers, uh, and that was, was really the, the turning point of the war. That was the high right. watermark of Japan's expansion, and six carriers had gone to Pearl Harbor on December 7th, four of them, the Akagi, the, the Kaga, the Hiryu, and the Soryu were at the Battle of Midway, and every one of them was sunk right. by the United mm-hmm. States, by flyers of the United States Navy. So that was the origin of the name Midway Airport, right. and uh, people probably think it has something to do with Midway, that we're in the middle of the country. Uh, that's what, as a kid, that was what I, when I first heard the name Midway, I thought, well, you know, Chicago's kind of in the middle of the United States, so that must mean we're, in, we're right. Midway from East Coast mm-hmm. to West Coast. And, of course, O'Hare, named for Butch O'Hare, who was one of the great American air aces of, of, uh, of World War II and who was killed uh, right. in combat in the Pacific as well. I think that was all. He was also killed in the Pacific. Right. And I always like to tell the story that um, the original name, if you've ever gone to O'Hare, and I think they still use O-R-D as the the three-letter code for O'Hare Airport, which O'R-D stands for orchard right. because it was it was a, it was previously known as orchard field and during the war there was a movement in the city when everyone was you know very patriotic and wanted to support the war effort to take this meaningless name orchard they wanted to change it to the name of the chief of staff of the United States Army General George C Marshall and there was a big push uh, to do this and I think I think this was something that the Sun Times was involved in, hmm. and uh, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, who was the publisher of the Chicago Tribune, decided to put a stop to that. Right. He did not want that to take place, and so he, the Tribune, which was was then as now the largest circulation paper in Chicago, and it meant a great deal more because newspapers were far more powerful in the 1940s than perhaps they are today. And there were more newspapers. There were there was the Chicago. Uh, the Daily News and the the Herald American and the Times and the Sun, which became the Sun Times. But in any event, he started a movement to name it for a real combat hero, right? Not for a general sitting, you know, be behind right. a desk in Washington. 
Butch O'Hare. Well, that well, once once they started that, there was no contest. There was no way they they were going to take preference for a for, for a, a general, a four star general, over an actual combat hero. But the real reason is very simple. Colonel McCormick did not want people landing in Chicago at Marshall Field. <laughs> Marshall Field (laughs) was the publisher of the Sun Times, the Mm -hmm. Democratic newspaper in Chicago, the trending Democratic paper, and the great rival of Colonel McCormick and the Tribune. Uh, And so that uh, that was the 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 real reason that Colonel McCormick did not want this to become Marshall Field. I think you can (laughs) you can see the significance of that. And that is why today we have O'Hare Field or O'Hare Airport. It's thanks to Colonel McCormick. Uh, And after the Battle of Midway, the Japanese Navy was always defensive. They never won on on another offensive. Uh, battle in terms yeah, that they were always playing catch up. They, in terms of expansion, I mean, they they were the, the Japan still had a, a formidable fleet. They still had a lot of battleships, in particular after Midway. But that took the heart. And in addition to losing the four carriers, they lost all those pilots. Right. All those pilots that were shot down in the battle, or that had no place to land because all the carrier, or they went down with the carriers. Right. So. Uh, that was it was it broke the back of J- of Japan's navy as an as an expanding ag- aggressive force from then on in it was the US navy that was in the driver's seat that we were attacking there were g- still great battles to come the battle of the philippines i was just reading last night about the battle of leyte gulf right which was the greatest naval engagement in the history of war on this planet. Was that the Marianas turkey shoot? No, that's different. Now, the, the, the Leyte Gulf was, was leading up to, to MacArthur's return to the Philippines. Okay. Uh, there, there, was, there was a battle of the Philippine Sea, and you had the, the so-called Great Marianas turkey shoot when we just downed scores of, of Japanese planes uh, in the air. But Leyte Gulf <coughs> was a huge naval engagement. The, the, it was like Japan's last ditch attempt to stop the United States from landing in the Philippines, to stop MacArthur from, from, from retaking the Philippines from Japan. So that would have been October early of, in the war. It was this month. It was October of 44. It was okay. in October of 44. And Gen- not as well known, and, but a much actually a much larger, not larger number of ships involved at Leyte Gulf. John, if I could add to that, uh, going back to Pearl Harbor, I uh, recently uh, read some commentary that uh, Admiral Nimitz, when he was assigned to uh, to oversee and take charge and all that, he made the assessment of, of the poor judgment of Japan. Uh, some were inclined to, to compliment them on their strategies and this, that, and the other. But he concluded that th- it was poor judgment in that they destroyed the ships, but they didn't destroy the ports. Right the value of the ports, and they mm-hmm. failed to destroy the uh, the fuel depots right. just over the ridge, over the mountain. Right. Having done that, it really would have significantly uh, disabled us. The machine shops, the right. repair That's facilities, right. they That's didn't right. target any of that. Right. I think they felt they had been so successful. They, they were successful beyond their dreams because they caught all of our battle wagons there at, our, at anchor, and sank, you know, sank or damaged or d- or disabled every single capital ship that we had there, and they didn't want it. it was a, it was kind of the, the the notion of don't push your luck, don't don't go back for that final bite of the apple and maybe lose everything. So they right. they they skedaddled, but as you say, if they had come back for another roundhouse punch and they had hit the the uh, the, 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 the ports, the fuel the fuel the depots, fuel depots. They had, had huge yeah. tank farms of of naval fuel there. And the the repair facilities, all the docks and everything, it could have it could have made re- rebuilding our fleet much more difficult. Right. And of course, the other fortunate thing is that the carriers were not there because the, yes. the Enterprise pulled in that night. You know, Admiral Halsey, in command right. of the of the the Enterprise, pulled in that night. And uh, fortunately, the carriers were not there, which they had hoped they'd ca- would catch them as well as the battle wagons. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, what the 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 U.S. had what two carriers at the time? There were two of them that were in the area, the the Enterprise and I think the Lexington. I think the Lexington was the other carrier that they hoped to carry. We didn't have that many carriers. We had the uh, the Saratoga, which was the Saratoga was a rebuilt cruiser. The Saratoga had been, had been had been had been had been designed as a cruiser, but then in the 1920s had been reconfigured and built to be an aircraft carrier. Right. And the Lexington 
was 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 in the fleet and the uh, the Enterprise. So we didn't have, you know, we did not have a huge navy. Our navy had been limited. We had signed this naval right. agreement in the 1920s that limited all the naval forces of all the major powers. So we didn't have the uh, the, the uh, ships available. And I, 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 I've been kind of keeping an eye on the clock, and I've just been reminded by our announcer that we're coming up on the on our break. So we're just a few moments away. So I'll I'll let I'll uh, let you. Uh, Digest all that we've said about the Knights of Columbus and <laughs> naval history, and uh, and here's our announcer, Rich Lang. Now for a brief intermission. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians, and we thank you for it. We'll be right back. Hello friends, are you looking for a place to have some printing done? Well I have the right place for you to go and that is the printing store in Oak Park, Illinois. Call or see Phil Berry at 621 Madison Street or call 708-383-3638. Phil Berry will sit down with you and help you plan whatever you need printed. Now his products are brochures, booklets, business cards, catalogs, envelopes, letterheads, flyers, invitations, newsletters, notepads, menus, mailers, manuals, labels, posters, postcards, price list, NCR forms, sale sheets, table tents, pocket folders, and presentation forms. And he also has one to four color offset printing, digital copying, high speed copying, graphic designs, typesetting, laminating, foil stamping, die cutting, and imprinting. And his complete binary service com includes booklets, cutting, scoring, folding, numbering, padding, and drilling. So once again, for all your printing needs, call or see Phil Berry at the printing store at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. They are located at Madison Street and Clarence, just east of Oak Park Avenue. And that's at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois. Or give Phil Berry a call at 708-383-3638. For all your printing needs, the printing store was there to help you. There are 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois. And once again, you can call Phil Berry at 708-383-3638. Now, back to our show. Let me make a general observation in World War II history. We talked about the importance of the Battle of Midway. Now, Early on in the war, the priority was given to defeat Germany, then Japan. Yet, it's a little ironic that the turning point in our war against Japan occurred far earlier than the turning point in any war against uh, uh, the Nazis and, and uh, Germany, which might have taken until Stalingrad till that war was being at, at its turning point. Right. So it's interesting, the whole Pacific War, in a sense, was defensive on the Japanese side. Right. That is interesting. Part, part of it is also because, remember, the Pacific was our war. I mean, we were in the war in the Pacific from day one. Right. The, the war begins with the attack on Pearl Harbor, and not mm -hmm. just Pearl Harbor, because they attack Wake, Wake and Midway and Guam and the Philippines. We had this string of island possessions through the Pacific. They're all attacked 
either on December the 7th or the next day, December the 8th. Right. Uh, so we're in that war from the beginning, and we have to fight that war immediately. We, we mm-hmm. can't. We have to uh, go into action very rapidly. By uh, with less than a year after Pearl Harbor, we're involved at Guadalcanal. We're mounting yep. our first big, you know, major right. combined arms, ground, sea, and air. Uh, offensive against the Japanese at Guadalcanal. Now, the Pis- Brits were our major ally against the Japanese, but they were so involved with the European war. That's right. Britain was, you yeah. know, Britain was was fighting, you know, for its life against Hitler. Yeah. Uh, they had lost... In 1939, before we even got into the war. They're, sure. they're, they're in, they've been in the war for two full years, you mm-hmm. know, 39, 40, before we became... And the Russians, Russians were not a factor at all in the Pacific no, War until about no. a week before... Until, uh, yeah, yeah, until yeah. they decided to come in and grab some of the goodies exactly. af- after we had defeated yeah. Japan. Britain, of course, lost... They suffered a great naval defeat with the uh, right at the time of Pearl Harbor because they had the battleship, the Prince of Wales, right. and a battle cruiser, the Repulse. And the Prince of Wales was, I believe, the ship that had carried Churchill to uh, Placentia Bay when they, when Roosevelt and Churchill met in August of '41, uh, and signed what was called the Atlantic Charter. Mm-hmm. And it was the, the Prince of Wales was a brand new battleship. It was involved in the the battle with uh, the Bismarck. Remember the movie Sink the Bismarck? Mm-hmm. Part of it focuses on the German, on the Amer- the British battleship, the Prince of Wales. These two mighty ships were sunk uh, in the South Pacific, I think, on December the 9th. Uh, and they were they were traveling without air cover. I mean, this was just suicidal. They sent these two ships out without any air cover whatsoever, and they came under murderous attack. But Britain couldn't be a factor in the Pacific. They were mm-hmm. they were fighting. On the continent, the India, Burma, you know, the, the uh, right. bridge on the River Kwai. The, the British had forces in Southeast Asia. But uh, the Pacific War was our war. And fortunately, we turned the tables on Japan six months after Pearl Harbor. I mean, right. mm-hmm. December, December 7th is the attack on Pearl Harbor, and the Battle of Midway it takes place the first week of June. June. So, uh, and it's funny because, you know, you may remember that Admiral Yamamoto, who was the commander of the Japanese combined fleet, was not in favor of going to war with America, knew what what the result would be. And he said, I can promise you six months of victory, and after that, nothing. Right. And he, was, he, was, he had it pegged right, right. virtually right. to the yeah. day. He said, I can run wild <laughs> in the Pacific for six months, and after that, forget it. Mm-hmm. So, well, we hope you've enjoyed our first half hour. We, we, we kind of covered a, a number of topics. And uh, it's customary in our uh, Meet the Chicago Historians that we look at the news of the day and spend a little bit of time at the beginning of the show looking at current events. So we've had some interesting current events both locally and, and nationwide. Uh, been some things in the news. The, uh, the American pastor who was freed uh, from Turkey, which this had been a a bone of contention uh, for some months between the United States and the Turkish government. And he was not only freed, he was received at the White House over the weekend. And you have a somewhat similar incident with the uh, the uh, commentator, columnist for the Washington Post, uh, who is, I believe, a, a Saudi national who disappeared in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, the old Constantinople, uh, Turkey. So any thoughts, any comments on, on any of these news mm-hmm. items, gentlemen? Kind of I'm uh, glad to see this, uh, Burton. I, you know, whenever something like this happens, uh, there's always the, the not the reason, but the, uh, th- the organizational problems of, getting these guys out. Uh, what did we give up? What did we promise? Uh, uh, I'm so glad that there's a, uh, not a politician in the White House now, that it's somebody that can can do this. And, and, and uh, you know, he knows how to make a deal. Uh, he's done it all his life. And that's what we need. And he's tough. And they, that's what it happened. They yeah. slapped yeah. sanctions on the Turks that were really yeah. painful for them. That were, and they were making it very clear to them that, that we wanted this man back. And this next guy, uh, and I can't think of his name, did you? Uh, Keshkagi? Khashoggi. Or Khashoggi. The, the fellow that disappeared, yeah. 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 Uh, this is going to be, you know, very interesting. 
I hope it turns out for the better, but it doesn't look like it. Mm. I hope this doesn't sour our relations with Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia has been a an ally of the United States since World War II, since FDR went boating with, with the king of Saudi Arabia on his way home from yeah. Yalta. It's, it's not well known, but on the way back from Yalta, FDR met with old King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia, the, really the founder of Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia has been a friend and ally of the United States ever since, every president from FDR onward. And we need friends in that part of the world. You have Iran, which is completely hostile to the United States. Iran was once an ally of America under the Shah. And when the Shah fell, it became a bitter enemy of America. Turkey had been our friend and ally for, for decades mm -hmm. as Saudi Arabia. And now under this new leader, uh, Erdogan, they've been cozying up to the Russians and to Putin. And even Egypt. Uh, Egypt was a firm ally of the United States under Sadat and under, uh, under his successor. And uh, they elected a government that was very hostile to the United States. It was toppled, but even the current leader, General Sisi, who's the, the, the leader of Egypt today, he's been on friendly terms with Russia as well. We need friends in that part of the world, and I hope this doesn't cause us to make some rash decisions. And and earn uh, you know and push Saudi Arabia into the arms of the Russians or the Chinese because they won't have any compunction about selling arms. That was something that uh, that uh, the president made very clear. They've got over a hundred billion dollars of arms sales with the United States, and if we cancel those deals, the Russians or the Chinese will be very happy to move in and sell those tanks and planes from their manufacturers instead right. of ours. I think we've got we have a phone call coming in. Any other thoughts, uh, Rich? Or I think the president has had to become a politician sort of by default, but I don't think he's real crazy about it. No. <laughs> no, he's not. You know, he's, he's a businessman. And, right. And, uh, I mean, that's what you need to run the country. And I think for a certain extent, that's business. why he was elected. Yeah. Foreign leaders know they're not dealing with a pushover. Yeah. They know they're not dealing with someone they can push around in Donald Trump. This is true. Right. Mm -hmm. He is a tough, tough leader and a tough negotiator. And he gets a lot of grief because of it. I saw Leslie Stahl last night griping about how, how terrible he's been to the Europeans. Well, he's just, he's just being as firm with the Europeans as they are with us when they're, when they're uh, negotiating trade deals. Or so even the Canadians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody else looks out for themselves. But we've been the great benefactor of the world. Everybody, all oh, the Americans, you know, they'll, they'll take care of everybody. They're they're uh, you know they're benevolent. We the we're, they're, we can take advantage of them, right. and he's not going to let them do that anymore. And up until this administration, they were right. Absolutely. He, re he just uh, redid and, and uh, the NAFTA, which was a, a joke, and and then uh, came right in with Canada and got uh, got that going. So you know you know the the guy is. Uh, He's the right man for the job at the right time. Absolutely. Excuse me just a moment, but we have a call coming in, and I believe it's our, it's our, uh, our moderator, our, our regular moderator, Jack Red. It's not his politics, folks. <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> Jack, are you there? You forgot to say illustrious. Oh, yeah, our, yeah, yeah. our illustrious oh. Red, I mean our illustrious moderator. Our yeah. peerless leader, too. Yeah. You know, Did yeah. you say fearless oh, or fearless? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I heard John, I heard Bill talking. I heard Rich, and who's there? And Jack. Jack. <laughs> Hi, Don. We've got a panel of four here. We, you, you would be the fifth. We had a fifth member, but he had yeah. to leave early. Right. Well, until 24 hours ago, about, I thought I'd be there for sure, but the best laid plans of mice and men, etc. you know. So, so how are we doing today, Jack? NAFTA, right? Say North what? American Free Trade Agreement. The, yeah, the, Bill was just talking about, about NAFTA. The funny thing about that was, if you remember, everybody was in favor of that. The left, the right, you know, Democrats, Republicans, when, when it was being drafted. That's know, right. Dur during Obama's tour. It was before that, though. That goes back to Clinton. Huh? I think I th it does. I mean, that NAFTA, back. NAFTA yeah, goes I back to so. the Clinton. Yeah, yeah I guess so, yeah. 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 Yeah, as, as, as he says, everybody was everybody was enthusiastic about yeah, it. Yeah, right. Oh, this is the best thing, you know. Uh, the only one I remember speaking out against it was Ross Perot. Do you remember? Yes, right. right. Talking mm -hmm. about years Zelda, the sucking noise, taking <laughs> drawing noise things from our country. Down to actually, he was right about that one for sure. You know. 
so for those anyway, of you who don't uh, know who Ross Perot was the fellow who ran for president saying let's look under the hood folks I got these signs here I got these placards here I got yeah. another one here let's look under the hood and see what's happening <laughs> he, he ran then he quit then he came back and then he said that the Vietnamese uh, North Vietnamese were uh, uh, running some kind of a uh, uh, conspiracy against his daughter's wedding reception or something yeah. like that. Something, yeah. something yeah. like oh, yeah. that that, you know, forever put him out there. So, H, I miss H. Ross Perot. I don't know what the H stood for. Don't know. No. Headstrong? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I sure wish I was with you guys, believe me. Well, we wish you were here as well. Oh. Yeah, and, uh, oh, thank you. And, uh, uh, let's see. I'm going in on the 31st of, uh, that is Halloween, of October, to have a hip, a hip replacement. I haven't had the other one done. Is that a good day for that? <laughs> well, I have to wear, they, they don't know what costume I'm supposed to wear. They're going to give me one as a patient, they said. <laughs> oh, jeez. I, I, uh, I hope the surgeon wears a decent one, too. Yeah, I hope, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I hope he wears the right mask. Case. <laughs> you know, as long as they're not going into anywhere that has any vital organs, you know, the hip, you know, is one thing. <laughs> oh yeah, let's all remind everybody. Uh, uh, this is the we're being recorded on the fifteenth of October. A week from today, October twenty second starts early voting. So hmm. I'm gonna make sure I vote in case they don't make it out of the hospital or you know right. you know what I mean to vote. Not you know right. Time. Get often vote yeah. early, vote often. Right. <laughs> well, I, the, the early part we can take care of, right? <laughs> Jack, while okay. you're there, I just want to mention that uh, your 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 pal Tom McKenna is not here today, and I just want, on his behalf, say that Tom always likes to point out that he is a long time, close personal friend of, of Jack Ryan, and he's one of the very few that is willing to admit it. <laughs> Wh who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back at him. See, shh. I know. Uh, he, he may not have gotten. He was supposed to be back by now. He, he and the wife, there, uh, and the family was out of town in Colorado for some family uh, wedding, so that would make them out of town. They didn't get back yet. I think they were driving this time. It's a beautiful drive. Ever, ever, anyone ever drive out west going, going that way? Long time ago, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, once you get it through Nebraska, <laughs> Iowa and Nebraska cornfields, <laughs> but it, it, is, it is beautiful when you get out near the, the foothills. Of, uh, the, the heartland of America. Oh, yeah. Oh, when you get out the west, though, Incredibly beautiful, I and mean, it's just, uh, I can recall as a little guy, I couldn't have been much older than my younger grandson right now, who's almost five, but I uh, used to see these old western pictures on television, and I just, and I think I saw a building, one of my dad being with a wrecking ball, and I asked my mom, how, how did they knock down the mountains, you know, <laughs> we've been seeing you around here, <laughs> she says, no, no, there are no mountains in Chicago area, and then <laughs> finally I got to see some real ones. Unless you see an old episode of, of, of uh, the FBI. I remember an episode of the FBI in which uh, uh, Erskine landed in, in Chicago. And he was doing a, a mission in Chicago. In the background, you could see the mountains <laughs> off in the not distance. Good. Oh. Not good. Well, <laughs> so, well, maybe that, now that could have been uh, Captain Folger's mountain, right? Yeah. Remember that one? <laughs> yeah, he would bring a mountain to Chicago. <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, I will bring a mountain. What is this guy, a preacher? What is he saying? Right. Because, because Chicago coffee. needs a good cup of coffee. Right. Folger's right. Mountain Grown Coffee. It was a really good yeah. campaign, though, as I remember. Yeah. Right. Uh, we, you know, we were mostly, let's see, where uh, you, 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 John, and uh, myself... And Tom, we're all in, in, in uh, 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 Dennis, we're all in grade school, and I know that junior high probably when that happened. That must have been, I would say, 1959, 60, that, that, uh, 58, 59, maybe? Yeah, he, he, and it, it, he didn't mention, at first he just said, I will bring a mountain to Chicago. Yeah. And then after a while, they added on because Chicago needs a good cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah, that was that was after about a week or so. Yeah. And, and, the, and the original one also said the following is addressed by Captain So and So Folger, and they showed it looked like you know whatever mountain, and they said, "Oh, right, we'll bring a mountain to Chicago." So, of course, that piques everyone's interest. What are they talking about? Who is this guy? You know, is this a preacher? What? Are we, what is the, is he a politician? <laughs> It was a memorable ad campaign when you realize that all these decades later, and we still remember it. Everybody, I mean, right, that's a right. successful ad. Mm -hmm. When it ran very shortly. 60 years later, people yeah. still remember mm -hmm. an ad campaign. And, and what product was going to be? became number yeah. one here, yeah. I don't know. Right. Of course, a mountain's better than a hill, you know, hill, Hills Brothers. Well, I, I, oh, I think we're misrepresenting what we consider a mountain. <laughs> he actually meant a mountain of taxes. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, that, well, we know that, you yeah. know. <laughs> Death right. in Texas, right? Well, that was back in the days of Richard the First, when Chicago yeah. was a, a King much, Richard the First. King Richard the First, when Chicago was very different from what it is today. Right. It, was a, it was a thriving city state. Yeah, <laughs> there was a, a movie in '37 yeah. in old Chicago. Oh yeah, in old Chicago. And at the very Don close Amici. to the end, they they were supposed to be showing the Chicago Fire, and the engine and a truck. They were going downhill towards the lake. <laughs> yeah, so probably I, filmed in San Francisco. Mm, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we 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 are quite a colorful place. Why is it all these beautiful places? Chicago, uh, San Francisco, uh, some others, uh, say over uh, Portland or you know, Berlin, Seattle, maybe Cicero. They have beautiful cities. They have such goofed up uh, uh, political uh, leadership. Well, that's in that's, area, yeah. Yeah. that's a sad fact of politics today. Take a look at what's been happening, though, Jack, with the uh, with the fires out west and with the hurricanes uh, on the uh, okay. east. Mm -hmm. uh, the Midwest looks enchantingly, you know, uh, right. uh, real nice now. No, I, I imagine a lot of those people wish that they were back here in Chicago. Well, we well, have to periodically no, no, thanks, deal with tornadoes, know. but uh, but when you look at the, the hurricanes yeah. and the forest fires and mm -hmm. the earthquakes, it's, yeah. uh, you know, it, 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 it seems an awful lot worse in, on, well, the, on the coast. Yeah, you're, you're right, but that's all natural. We can't really, you know, we can only contend with that to a degree, right? This mm -hmm. other this other business, we could all change. It's in our power to change and, you know, prevent. Well, I thought it was all man-made. I thought we need to have massive taxes and, and regulations right. to control all this. Oh, no, you thought that was natural? <laughs> <laughs> taxes yeah, will taxes, cure everything. A, a growing, of, of uh, ever-growing federal monster of a government with tentacles reaching everywhere. Anyway, yeah, how's before, that for Before we built all these factories, there were no hurricanes. There were no, there were no earthquakes. There were no storms. The, the climate mm. was just placid and... Uh, Maybe nothing ever NAFTA. happened. Full of smoke? Yeah. <laughs> nothing ever happened. Well, How about NAFTA? Do they have anything to do with that? Oh, I wonder. Well, Jack, we'll, you know, we're, our, uh, we want to give you the date. Our next program is going to be November the 19th, so mark it down on your calendar. Yeah. It'll be our Thanksgiving edition of, uh, Aha. of There's Meet a the thought. Chicago Historians. Thanksgiving edition. Yeah. Boy, that makes me a real turkey, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that was a foul Ooh. joke. <laughs> I, thought you, I thought you were Irish. Give us Barabbas. Uh, turkey, you know, that that, that is a, a slang term for an Irishman, right? A turkey? You yes. never yeah. heard that one. I never heard that oh. either. Oh, no. Oh, turkey, all turkey the time. No. Oh, come on, yeah, you turkey. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. You learn so something is. every day. <laughs> <laughs> I know why they call my, my other... Uh, my other lineage, uh, German, Krauts, because that's cabbage, right? Sure. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was uh, like Charles Krauthammer. Is that, is that that name, the late Charles Krauthammer? Does that name sound German? A bit. Just a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 yeah. <laughs> and sour and how about Kugelman? Is that a German name? It's a crabby cabbage. Yeah. Which, I'm sorry. What's what was the last name you said, uh, Jack? Kugelman. <laughs> that, yeah. That's, that has uh, a German yeah, ring. Yeah. That's yeah. Deutsch. German. A little Swiss in there, too. Don't think we don't have yeah, any, German we Swiss, any right? Obits here for a while. Is don't forget, Swiss had how many cantons are German, how many are French, and how many are Italian speaking. Right? Yeah. Don't forget Romanche. They have a fourth language in Switzerland called Romanche. How about Ligorian? <laughs> 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 or, they actually uh, have, they have four the official thing? languages. That's just a chant. Oh. How about Esperanto? No, Esperanto is not one of them. Mm. <laughs> it's All not right. one. Not an official language? Maybe well, it Pig should Latin. Be. Maybe you have a Mo Ole and Pig Latin. Pig Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Or Carney. That I never heard of. You can see I had my morning coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, i got to hang up now. Well, well take care of yourself. Thanks for joining us, Jack. Thanks for bringing the show to a crashing point. <laughs> 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 we, <laughs> we certainly appreciate you doing it. And, <laughs> and and thank we hope we hope all is well at at the at the Ryan uh, man. Yeah, things are getting better. So That's I good. was I was just making a pause there, waiting for all the applause to stop when I said I have to hang up. So. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Give so us have a very us, right? have a very happy Halloween and good luck Take on care. your surgery. You. No. Take care, Jack. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. That was oh. Jack Red. It's not his politics, oh. Ryan. <laughs> And uh, he's our, our regular host. And as we say, he's, he's, we've got family uh, circumstances today, and he's not here with us. But we appreciate Jack calling in. 
and uh, we had a brief interlude with our regular moderator. Uh, Bill, I interrupted you. I don't know if you want to mm. go back. You were you were talking when when we uh, went on the air. Maybe if I perhaps finished your thought. Does anyone have no. anything further they'd like to add about the uh, the uh, Mr. Khashoggi, the uh, the fellow that disappeared in the in the consulate, or the pastor? You were talking about the pastor that that President Trump had secured his release. When yes, I, and when he had I a meeting with off. him, and it turned out fine. But uh, this Khashoggi Kah- or whatever his name is. No. Uh, that doesn't look like it's going to turn out too uh, yeah. too uh, good. So uh, hopefully it will. But uh, uh, it's uh, this foreign policy politics is uh, really up for grabs now. Mm-hmm. The way uh, the way things are going, and uh, God bless Trump. He's uh, he's standing pat. Oh, we'll see what happens. We live in a world in which many of our adversaries have very tough leaders. You know, Putin in Russia, the new president of China, who's who's gathering more and more power. The, right. the feeling is mm-hmm. that he, uh, he is he, he is going to break with they had a, a two term tradition in in China that had developed in recent years, and he is breaking with that. He apparently wants to be president for life, as previous communist leaders had been in. in in the Soviet Union and in China, and we face a world in which there are, there are some tough customers that the president has to deal with, and we need a we need a commander in chief that's just as forceful, looking out for er, our national interest, and doesn't consider America to be a, you know the benevolent society and the, the Salvation Army of the world, which unfortunately too often we've had this attitude mm. that our responsibility is to look out for everyone else rather than than our own interests. So, can you imagine what what our country would be like if if uh, Trump hadn't won you just I heard some talk on the radio we'll speculate that. exactly uh, what, I heard what, that what it would have been like if, if Hillary had been elected yeah. in 2016 yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. it's it's not if if, if you think as, as as I do and I think as we do it it wouldn't be a very pleasant picture of what uh, the really direction this country Bill would be would headed really run into country at least he'd be roving ambassador. <laughs> the emphasis well, yeah. on roving? Yeah. He's got a roving <laughs> mind, so he must be, the rest of them be roving too. Well, they're going on a book tour. Uh, yeah. I think it's the yeah. equivalent of a book tour. It's like I just heard where they're, they're going on this multi-city uh, tour, an evening with, with Bill and mm-hmm. Hillary. Uh, and and they're, not, they're calling it an evening with former President hmm. William Clinton. Gee, to raise some money, perhaps? want to be President <laughs> Hillary. The, the cheap, I heard something, the, the, the cheapest ticket is like 75 bucks and that's in in and when they get into the the larger venues the prices are going to go and those are the cheapest seats mm-hmm. and but you get to spend an evening with bill and hillary <laughs> and, and talking with, and i don't think it's tied to a particular book i don't think either one of them have come out with a new book right. it's just it's just a a personal appearance tour what's an the evening country. 15 minutes i don't know I, I think <laughs> I'm thinking you could hear the crickets sounding in the in the background. <laughs> Can you imagine what a cup of coffee costs there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe uh, yeah. she was on uh, 60 Minutes last night. She was she had just recently said that we don't need civility yeah. right. in our politics. There's that you can't be civil with people who want to destroy everything you believe in. And I thought to myself, doesn't she understand that that works both ways? That those of us on the other side of the spectrum considered what she and her friends wanted. They were going to destroy everything we believe in. That's Obama right. was, was destroying everything that I believed in. So she's saying if, if the other side's doing that, you don't have to be civil. I mean, well, that works both ways, hmm. Madam Secretary. Strange quote. And wasn't yeah. the old attorney general saying something about kick them under down or something like that that's gotten a lot of plus somebody somebody had said when they someone in one of the democratic campaigns said when they go low we go high as if as if the republicans are the ones that are oh, mu- michelle made that money quote. yeah right. yeah, yeah was yeah. that michelle yeah. Yeah. As, and they always like to project on us what they do as if we were that's running right. the dirty campaign and we were running right. the unfair practices and now the thing is, I think it was uh, Eric Holder said, when they go low, we kick them while they're down. Or something yeah, like something that. like that. Yeah. And now he walked it back and said, well, I didn't really mean that. Yeah. You know, I, well, I didn't really mean no, that. Remember Don't take me literally. When, yeah. What was Obama said when when your opponent has a knife, you go get a gun? Well, that was... That was that was uh, uh, the old the Untouchables movie. Sounds like that, Sean Connery. Sean Connery. Yeah, that's when, the when, Chicago way. When they bring yeah. a knife, but, you bring a but gun. But didn't Obama say that? 
He oh. may have quoted it. I, I think, think he may have made a reference it, yeah. to it. Yeah. And once again, folks, we're coming up on we're we're, we're having so much such a rollicking good time here, That's folks. Right. We're running right up to the time. So I, this is John Escachogo, and I will pass you off to our ace announcer, Rich Lang. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. We'll be right back. Do you suffer from pain? Do you know someone that has constant pain of their low back, neck, shoulder, knee, or wrist? Have they tried medications, exercise, physical therapy, or chiropractic, and nothing seemed to make it better? Well, I may have your answer. Why not try a napropath? Hi everybody, this is Dr. Wayne Chickowitz, and I've been practicing 30 years treating pain. I'm board certified and hold a diplomat in pain management. For your convenience, we have two locations in Cicero, 3602 South 61st Avenue, 708 656 or in Villa Park at 122 West St. Charles Road, Suite 1A, 630 833 4007. Why not try a napropath and stop the pain today? To our show, John. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're we're back here at Meet the Chicago Historians with our our autumn edition. We're here in the great month of October, and we've had a, a good first hour talking about a variety of topics. We've been covering the the news of the day, and uh, does anyone have any other issues that they'd like to add? We've got elections coming up, of course, in just a few weeks now. The midterm elections, uh, the two year uh, midpoint of, of uh, President Trump's first term uh, in office and a uh, great deal of campaigning. We have a race for governor in the state of Illinois. Uh, so we have many, many things in the offing. Any any thoughts, any comments? Yes, like very much so. I'll be so glad when it's over with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Those ads get tiresome, oh. don't they? Yeah, but then the 20 election starts. Well... No. There's one after the other every right four right years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, to see some of the things that they're pulling is uh, it, it just makes you sick. You know, it's. Um, I think a lot of people are catching on about it, though. Oh, I think so too. Yeah. Getting yeah. What's going to happen in our mayoral race? That's going to be very interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, what's his name? McCarthy, the old uh, the former uh, superintendent of police. Yeah, yeah, he's in it, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I don't. And I think I about sixteen others. Hey, I was going <laughs> to say. Yeah. Freckwink. Oh my God! I, yeah, I can't remember all of them now. They. Uh, Lori Lightfoot. All these interesting, yeah. interesting yeah. types. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Paul Vallis. Excuse me. Yeah. This is a good voice. How many offices has Paul Vallis had in the last five years? Mm. About every one you can think of, wasn't it? And well, in several cities, too. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After he left here, that yeah, he went to another city and another city, yeah. Well, hmm. let's not forget that in just a few months, we may once again get out all the old stationery that says Mayor Daly. Because uh, yeah. Bill Daly, William Daly, yeah, he's in it. Is, has announced his candidacy. And... Uh, I haven't seen any polls or anything. And of course, they wouldn't mean anything now anyway because the election is still a good, t a good time off in the distance. But uh, I certainly wouldn't count out the daily name in the city true, of Chicago. True. Well, if you haven't seen any polls lately, you should have been in. You were in the wrong neighborhood. Oh no! Da 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 da. And what is your name again for people who want to send uh, the ca cards and letters on that comment, please? If you would identify uh, yourself. Yeah, all you polls, I right? Wrote the Fifth <laughs> Amendment. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we have a, a very a very open field for the office of mayor of Chicago. 
Well, it'll be interesting uh, when it gets down to the, you know, a month before or so, and see when all of how the real uh, garbage comes out about uh, so and so and so and so and so and so. When is the next mayoral election? Next spring? I think February. February. Oh, is it? Okay, it's second. Oh, it's a primary. Not this fall. They don't run parties anymore in Chicago. No, it's all nonpartisan. It's an open primary. Everybody runs, (laughs) and then. uh, if a candidate, if no one candidate gets fifty-one percent of the vote, or actually fifty percent plus one, then they have to have a runoff with the top two candidates. So uh, we shall see what happens. It's, with given this field, it's it would seem unlikely that any one candidate could get fifty right. percent right. of the vote. They're all going to have a slice of the pie. But then it will. The question will be which which are the two that that make it into the the finals, and then. Uh, who endorses whom? Who throws their support mm-hmm. behind whom? And it could be very interesting. Was anyone surprised that uh, that Emmanuel did not decide to run? I was. You were. Yeah. I'm, the more I think about it, I can understand this rationale. I wasn't really yeah. surprised. Yeah, announcement. Because I think with that that kid on the south side, who got killed. I think they had a lot to do with it because he. Didn't he put anything off until after the election or something like that they were talking about? The withholding he, of the tape of the... Yeah, yeah he withheld the Juan tape. Juan shooting, yeah. No, I wasn't surprised, but I was certainly glad. I just think that there's just so many problems emerging in the city, and there's so much, so many that I think Emmanuel, you know, probably decided that the wiser course of action is to, you know... I'd be interested to see if he's... If he still lives in Chicago after he leaves, mm. and what's his next step going to be? Yeah, you think he might have run for Congress or something, or I don't know, governor? No, <laughs> no, I can't. I can't no. see him. I can't see him as a candidate for governor, no. regardless no, no, of what no. happens in this election. No, no. 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 I don't see. I, I truly you might see it as a step down. I never. I never thought he. I never thought of him as a mayoral prospect. No, you know, right. I, I mean he. He had been in the administration. He'd been a congressman. I never thought of him. Some that was on track. For the mayor's office, and I, I still don't understand how. That I kind of thought when he became, yeah. when he left, what was he, Obama's head of staff or something Chief like that? Chief of staff. Chief of staff. Chief of staff. Yeah. yeah, when he did that, mm-hmm. I I was wondering if he was, because he made some, some statements. He, he wanted to be mayor because it was. Yeah, that's. Well, was my favorite, my favorite Rahm Emanuel quote was when he said, "The only way to deal with Republicans is with a two by four across the side of their head." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the party that accuses us of being uncivil. And, uh, That's and, right. And, and, and here's a guy that didn't live in the city either running. He had well, a, didn't he own a house or rented a house or something? They rented that There's some house. some controversy about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and his wife's wedding dress was in the basement. That's how they so. yeah. said it was okay. Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure, he's a resident. Yeah. He's doing it by a thread, literally. <laughs> I'm sure that's in the statute guy. books. You know, residence is established by having your wife's wedding dress on yeah. the premises, uh, or at least a pair of shoes. <laughs> yeah. One Let's woman see. I've always admired in the background of Ram, uh, his wife Amy Rule. She seems like a nice, quiet, intelligent woman. When what she's up to? How much does she have in influencing his career? You wonder. Maybe she's a real power behind the. Is throne. she a teacher, or what? What is? Uh, I, I think she has some teaching background. Is Somebody is the first a time I've actually heard her name. As the first lady of yeah. Chicago, she's very quiet, very yeah. much behind the scenes. Well, Even Ram I'm does that on, on purpose. Good. Good. Any thoughts on the gubernatorial race for the office of governor of the state of Illinois? Yeah, I think we've seen the last debate, so called. I didn't, and I didn't, I didn't catch any of them. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't see any of them. Any a lot of name calling. A lot of, a lot of them were uh, were uh, the editorial boards, where they they, you know, was a private, just uh, let the uh, media in. But uh, I guess they were all the same. They all ended up like a like a uh, fist fight. Well, we couldn't have been so lucky. <laughs> Okay, well. Both men of means, by easily. Any other items in the news that anyone would like to talk? Before we get on to our, our main topic of the day, uh, we're, we're here under the uh, uh, premise that we're going to discuss Chicago sports championships. Okay. Champions. Uh, this is getting back more into history, but when did the Chicago Tribune dropped the thing on the front of the paper, the world's greatest newspaper? Oh, that was, I think, in the 70s? I'm going to say roughly, yeah, not that 
far back. Early 70s. No, no. Huh? It was after Colonel McCoy. I mean, uh, it Long stayed after his death. No. I remember delivering the papers. In the 50s when I was a kid, in, in, when I was reading it in high school and college, they still had that logo, the world's greatest newspaper. Right. And they did away with it, I th- I'm going to say, in the early to mid-70s. I think that's about right. I remember okay. somebody, one of their hmm. spokesmen being on TV, because it was, it was controversial, and he said, well, we dropped it because we thought it was self-evident that everybody knew we were the world's greatest newspaper. It goes without we, saying. We didn't, yeah, we didn't have to say it, but <laughs> they went through a period there where they were trying to sort of de McCormick eyes, I think, the tri- if I can okay. coin a phrase, that they wanted to change the image of the Tribune. It ceased to be as thoroughly Republican a newspaper uh-huh. as it had once been. They wanted to be considered more more open minded. Uh, they, after all, they endorsed. I believe they endorsed Obama for president. I believe, <laughs> and I they had they so. had they had endorsed Democrat. They began endorsing Democrats for uh-huh. major offices, which was never the case in the past. In the Republic, the, the the Tribune, I think, uniformly endorsed. Republican candidates for for most. They were always jobs. considered Republican. Yeah, I don't right. think they're anywhere near or yeah. even decide they, they didn't, state they, to be. Near they it. wanted to. They wanted to, to to deep six that image. They wanted to be thought of as a more open minded, uh, uh, middle of the road newspaper, and not the arch conservative paper that uh, that it had been. Which is odd because the country was becoming more conservative, was moving in their direction, right. and they decided to go. I always thought it was strange. They decided to go the other way. Because right. this is just a few. I think they may have done it while Nixon was in the White House. It may have been in that era. Could probably. have been. And it was just not long before Reagan entered the White House and began a very conservative era. But they wanted to change the image. They. Um, and I, I guess they changed their goal to simplify our spelling in this country. Oh yeah, yeah. That was a period. <laughs> yeah. Through words like that, T H R U. Which yeah. makes some sense as far as... Simplified spelling. Exactly. But that, I guess, has gone nowhere. They I changed th- the flag, too. If you remember, they used to have that very, very uh, Im- beautiful flag on the, on the you know, the rippling in the right. wind. Right. Right. And that was part of their masthead. You know, the mm-hmm. Chicago Tribune, the world's right. greatest name. There was another. They had a... It said, the American paper for Americans. Do you remember that? Was that not the them or the Herald American? The no, Herald I think the, the Tribune used that. The okay. Tribune used that phrase Missed as well. It. And I remember and they did away with that. I remember speaking of doing away with. Remember about this time of the year, after the first frost, they had engine summer on the oh, front. Yes, on the uh, on the sun that uh, they done. It, they they dropped that some years ago. Yeah, politically Actu- incorrect. Actually, I got for Christmas. My dad got me one of them from the Tribune, and they used to sell that thing on a parchment thing. And I have it uh, mounted. It was very moving. I would always cut every year. I remember cutting it out, putting right. it on my bulletin board at home. And, and then it went out every year. It went kind of, and then later on they put it in the back, and then it kept getting smaller and smaller, and then it was gone. Mm. They gradually de-emphasized, but yeah. it would always be on the cover of their Sunday magazine. Right. At, at the beginning of autumn, you know, engine summer, and they had the real, the real uh, uh, setup on display at the Olson Rug Company. That's correct. Was was located at Diversity and Pulaski, right. right across the street from Engine Company Ninety One. Right. And then when Olson Rug Company uh, went out of business or moved out of that that building over there. There is a place, a pumpkin farm, out west on North Avenue, past Route 59. Uh, forget um, mm. it begins with a with a P. Pleasant, uh, Pleasant Run or something like Pleasant that. Pleasant Run. Yeah, and there's a big florist out there. Oh my God, people is at a huge place, and they had that set up out there. Uh, Sunny Acres, that's what right, it is. Okay. Sunny yeah. Acres out there on West West North Avenue, way past. Uh, Route 59, just before you get to the uh, uh, to the airport out, right. out there, and they had that uh, that set up out there. So one from from the newspaper to Olson Rug out to Sunny Acres. Yeah, and yeah. in that there was a like I guess they call it a rock garden. Hmm. On in in Christmas they had at Santa Ol- Claus. Olson Rug. They had yeah. the water. Yeah, yeah. They water. Had waterfall. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And at Christmas they they had a. Uh, uh, Santa Claus and maybe a Thanksgiving. Maybe Thanksgiving was Indian summer. 
Yeah, well, they had dinners and stuff just about this time of the year. They yeah. had, yeah. had, had yeah. set up out there. Yeah, yeah, we haven't had real Indian summer. Is, is technically it's after the when you have a warm up after the, the first, first frost. frost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we haven't had a hard. Just, they say tonight we may get a, a frost throughout the whole area. Uh, Saturday yeah, morning I came out and there was a little yeah. bit of frost on the on yeah. the the grass. I lost a few plants in my yard, but everything else survived what we've had so far. Mm-hmm. Did you call the police? I didn't feel it necessary. <laughs> okay. I, I didn't feel it necessary. I gave him mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. And okay. okay. I up put a few w- things uh, in the shed that it I was kind of cold in you though. Yeah. But up in Wisconsin, we had a heavy, we had a heavy frost up in Wisconsin. Well, I imagine, yeah, you did. Yeah, because um, I didn't see it, but my sister said that when she woke up uh, Saturday morning, she says there was a heavy frost on the roofs, on the garage roofs, and roofs of the of the houses uh, up up by her. So. Uh, I should give a free commercial. Every every summer, the town takes excursions up to your your neck of the woods, John. I don't know how close it is to you. A place called Apple Holler, Apple, in, a, Apple Holler in that's, Wisconsin. That's, that's just, just a couple miles away from us. I was going to say it probably isn't yeah. far from you. And they have uh, it's an apple orchard, hmm. and they grow peaches as well and pears, I think. But it's a nice it's a nice place to visit. They have a fine restaurant there, an old country restaurant like a country inn. They sell apple pies and all sorts of fresh bacon. Oh, you're you're talking about apple um, holler. No, not uh, no, that's. Um, you're uh, not thinking of Apple River Canyon. In no, the no, 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 no. Jeez, my sister and I were just talking about going there next weekend. It's nearly, um, it's not far from Lake Geneva. It's in the. Hmm. It's on the. Oh, it'll, it'll, the road goes one way to Lake Geneva, and the other. Yes, way to yes, Apple yes. It'll it'll it'll, 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 it'll come to me in a, in a minute. Uh, yes, I we we go to all. They sell apple pies. They bake apple pies in a bag. And I a friend a friend of mine friend of mine bought one of their apple pies, and he mm. said it was oh, absolutely it, delicious. Oh, yeah, so it, if you're ever it, up in yeah. Wisconsin, yeah, look up Apple Holler. It's a ni- it's a nice. They have a they have an animal you know like a petting zoo. They have animals there and uh, souvenirs, and it's a nice country uh, destination, uh, particularly this time of year in the fall. Hey, by now it should be just a suburb. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking before about the uh, <coughs> Tribune's long running slogan, "The world's greatest newspaper." I see that recently its major competitor, the Sun Times, trying to call itself. I think the world's hardest working paper yes yes yeah they've, yeah. they've, they've coined right. that phrase yeah you know, and well, of course that's going to go gentlemen the name of it is the er- eric and farmer that's 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 the one that uh, that's up by by us what is it was that eric uh oh, oh god it, it'll come to me Just farmer c- yeah, yeah yeah it's a big place when 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 my when my kids my two kids and my t- and my two nephews uh, they used to go up there and pick apples. They used to go on 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 a bar, on a on this uh, wagon, and then they would pick. They, up that's what that's what they do at this yeah. place, and I'm going to yeah. Apple Holler. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. they take you out on a tour of the grounds in a wagon. You yes. stop and you get to pick mm-hmm. apples. And uh, Eric, and, like, Eric and Farmer Cicero Residence. That's what it is. Eric and Farmer. Oh, so this, they, they do it for they have the, the yeah. senior uh, service, the senior activities okay. in town. It takes it's on route takes bus loads of mm-hmm. them. I, bl- I believe it's on Route 120 up in up in Wisconsin. I think you're right. I, I think, yeah. that's, I think mm-hmm. that's right. I just want to mention, you know, uh, we were talking about the world's greatest newspaper. And a little factoid here, of course, we have WGN Radio hmm. that's right. and WGN Television because yeah. they were owned by the Tribune Company, and that's the right. WGN comes from. Da, 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 what world's greatest newspaper, <laughs> right. folks. That's, funny. That's right. Yeah. That's but they did have. I'm thinking back. They under that, they had they had another another banner that said the American paper for Americans. That sounds. And that was the first to go. Mm. That went first, and then the world's greatest newspaper went after mm, that. Okay. And to give you an idea of the transformation of Tribune, I'm almost positive since 1980 they did not endorse Ronald Reagan for president. I think it was the first time they had not endorsed a Republican candidate for president. That's they endorsed started. John Anderson, who was the, the liberal Republican who was running as an independent. He was a Republican nominally, but he wasn't the Republican nominee. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain in 1980 they did not endorse Reagan because they felt he was too conservative. And that Colonel was McCormick must would be have, that, over in his grave. That was the old. I, yeah, right. <laughs> this, they've, that's expression's been used many times. That Colonel <laughs> McCormick is turning over in his grave. Did you hear something about taking his office and turning it into a condo? 
Well, they're talking about selling the. I mean, or, or they've. I don't have. They sold the Tribune Tower. Or they yeah, they were going to make condos. I think they dismantled his office. Maybe they're going to save some of the bookcases or something. Right. But I think it's just it's, it's a piece of history now. It's right. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful building, and yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I always enjoyed going there and looking at all the stones that are embedded in the in the uh, uh, facade um, of the building from all the, the south great buildings south, from right. the the, the, ch the the Great Wall of China and Buckingham Palace. I'm not sure, but right. <laughs> when there's, there's something, I don't know if it's the Tower of London. I one think of so. the great one of the great yeah. buildings in London. There is a stone from that building, and all sorts of historic buildings in America and throughout right. the world. Uh, the Colonel apparently was able to secure a little chip. And, and had it embedded into right, the right. facade. That would be considered building. politically didn't, incorrect now. Didn't they I'm sure it would yeah. be. put a piece yeah. of one of the World Trade Centers in the wall lately? They may, may have. Oh, I, mean, I, I, so. I, I remember going there when I was like in college. Right, you could see them looking. all. They all may have added to I it. I think from they're right Scotland then. and yeah. all over. Right, hmm. yeah. right. Interesting. And that was. Barney Castle. That was. What was the name of that The area around there? Pioneer Court? I think that sounds right. Yeah, Pioneer Court. Yeah, and then yeah. they built a building in the back, which International well, Harvester had, used for a while. They had that statue of Nathan Hale, you know, the statue of Nathan Hale that's in the fr in, in the entrance way to the Tribune. Uh, I that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that was you one mean of the where yeah, it was Nathan set Hale. back. Yeah. And somebody's com was somebody's uh, maybe it was the architect supposed to put his initials somewhere in all that fancy work around the. You know the entrance, and yeah. I've never seen anybody's initials in there. Of course, you know the Tribune Tower. It's a it's a Gothic building. I mean, you've got the, it's built like like a, a, a cathedral. It's with the same no. architecture as a right. Gothic cathedral. And that was Colonel McCormick's way of saying, "I am a conservative. Mm. I a, like the past." A major right. contest. He's of right. Yeah, that building. and yeah. they and they chose they chose that right. Gothic mm. the, the Gothic with the flying buttresses. Yeah. Right. And the, yeah. It's a beautiful I, building. I mean, it, it's certainly a, a right, distinctive building. They had a contest of architects, right? Exactly. And right. is there anything to the truth that building across the street was the sec the runner up to that? I Not don't, the I don't think so. What was what's the one across the street? I don't know. I do know Not this. Not the Wrigley Building. Yeah. That, I, I think that predated the Tribune Tower. Oh, okay. Well, that was the first it wouldn't be that then. Yeah. They're all from the same general era. I mean, all those oh, great, yeah. all those yeah. great right. buildings. Great all 1920s. Those great, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Union Carbide building oh, yeah. downtown oh, was yeah. another great one. The Pure Oil building with the cupola on top. Right. The, at least that was what it was called when I was a kid, the Pure Oil building. Was that the one that was supposed to be... Uh, Union Carbide I, and Carbon. A mooring place for the... Dirigibles? Dirigibles, yeah. Well, that, the Empire State Ooh. building was supposed to be yeah. a mooring place for dirigibles. there was one in Chicago. They found that the wind was too great that it was and impossible. And one of them crashed and went down on LaSalle Street. That happened in 19... 1919. Yeah. Yeah. That happened in 1919. Just uh, just around the time my mother was born, in fact. I think it was in January of 1919 okay. that a Zeppelin crashed in, in Chicago. Would have been the a number of people. Was bank at, I don't yeah, know it was, the, it was near a bank building. It was near yeah. a bank building. That's right. But uh, the interesting thing is, you know, you remember the old Sun Times building Sun across Times? the street, yeah. mm -hmm. which is now gone. But that was deliberately designed as a very modernistic, you know, as a very, like, 90, well, what was modernistic in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. But as a, as a counterpoint to the Tribune Tower, it was a way the Sun-Times saying, we're not like the Tribune. We're right. a modern, progressive right. paper, and our right. building reflects, you know, contemporary architecture point, yeah. compared to, you know, the historic architecture right. of the Tribune Tower. Is that Tower. where the Trump Tower is now? Yes. I think it is. Yes, I think it, it is. is, yeah. It's kind of ironic, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I must gall people to have that. You know, he, he owns a building and have that name of his just, just emblazoned no, I mean, there. But him being supposedly conservative. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and taking the place of, this, the old, of the old Sun Times, yeah. I was in the that building. You shared that building with the Sun Times right yeah. now. I was in that yeah. building once, and for some reason I had to pick something up or, or I had a meeting with someone. I remember going into the Sun-Times, and not just to walk in, but I had a, right. a meeting or something that took me to the Sun-Times building. So I was in the, the Sun-Times. I was in the Tribune Tower a number and of times. And you could see the presses? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I was there for a reason, so I didn't have right. time, but I did look around a little bit. And uh, so, you know, it's, and, and you realize it's gone. I mean, at the time yeah. it didn't mean yeah. that much to me until right. you realize now it's gone. And, right. Uh, you know, so... Yeah. Wasn't there a Daily News building well, right next same. to the river? Well, they were the, the Times and the Daily News were. were they, they were, they were right they, on the they, river. They were yeah, all right? put out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They showed the yeah. same building. Yeah. 
Yeah, the old the old Chicago Daily News. I've which got was their a, last issue. It was on a Saturday, and it said "So Long Chicago" or something. Yeah, like because that. they you know they didn't yeah. publish a Sunday edition. There was no and Sunday Daily News. Then the governor right. of, of Illinois no, bought it, and they yeah, had they two or three issues, Sunday. and that it went kaput too. Uh, I, I remember my aunt and uncle would come to visit us, and they would stay, would stay the weekend with us. And my, my uncle would go out and get the daily news on Saturday. And I had never seen the daily news. I, I don't even know as a kid I knew there was a daily news, if I had maybe had heard of it. But I loved it because they had all these comics that I had never seen. Right. Because my family always got the Tribune. We, were, we always got the Chicago Tribune. Right. And my grandmother, who, who lived downstairs from me, she got the what was then the Herald American and became Chicago's American. Right. Mm-hmm. But as a kid, the, the main thing about a newspaper were the comics. And I remember my uncle and I. I would just this was like you know once every whenever they would come to stay with us, I'd get these these comics that I never saw the rest of the, of the time and right. whatever these comic strips were in the daily news at that time. But they didn't publish a Sunday edition. Their Saturday paper was the equivalent of a Sunday newspaper. Right. That's when all the comics and magazines and everything. Came. My grandfather just loved the columnists in the Daily News, like oh, yeah. Sidney J. Harris yes. and the people like that. I, I, it was right afternoon paper. In later years, when I when I would be downtown, I would always pick up the Daily News when I would uh, on my way to the train, on my way to the to the Burlington train, which went out west. And I remember Sidney Harris had a great column. Uh, Royko, I think Royko was was a Daily News columnist. He was. Didn't he go to the Earlier. Tribune? After he wound up with yeah. the Tribune, but he was. And he was the with Daily the Sun News. Times for a while too. But, I think but he did when, all when, three. The, when the yeah. Daily News folded, he went to the Times, I believe, and right. then then. Then he hated uh, Murdoch. I Murdoch, believe. right? It was Rupert something Murdoch, Murdoch, right? Yeah. That then he went to the he uh, went to the Tribune. The Tribune. Yeah. But they had yeah. great columnists in the uh, in the Daily oh, yeah. News. Yeah. Oh yeah. They had a sports columnist. He had a very, a very well respected. Mm. I'll think of his name. But he had. I, I he, he was, it was I a very, ever, an older man at the time. He had been like a legend in sports reporting. I used to. My uncle knew him. I, I, mm. My uncle knew him, and I would read his column in the paper. Right. I'll have to. Some in the course of the program, I'll probably think of his name. I used to deliver to Sun Times in the Tribune, and then we had a couple, not weird ones, but it was a Polish Daily Zoda. That's still around, I believe. Yeah. In. Uh, <laughs> Believe it or not, I had 200 papers to Tribune and the Sun Times, and I bet you I had 25 or 30 of these things. And boy, those people, if you didn't put them in a certain spot on their porch, oh, yeah. they would call <laughs> up. I well, even sometimes with the Tribune and the Daily News, or, I mean the Sun Times. I never delivered papers, but I remember when the paper boy would come to the door Boom. collecting, collecting for the paper. Remember? Did you have to do no. that? I remember oh, paper boys coming, and they had their little ticket, and you had to pay. I don't know if it was once a month or once a week. I don't remember how frequently, but they would come, and you'd pay individually for. You know, they no. didn't do it by mail or, or email or anything. Agency, and I got a whole twenty dollars a month for <laughs> delivering the papers. Yeah. yeah, I was delivering the Big North Side uh, neighborhood paper, and uh, yeah, I'd have to do the collecting. Yeah, and maybe um, you'd be lucky to get one fourth of your s- people. Paying you that kind of thing too. Oh my God. The rate was very low. Right. But, uh, uh, those were the days. What was the newspaper? That wasn't. Um, that Seven wasn't the uh, Lincoln Belmont Booster, was it, um, Rich? Was, it, was that John? Was that the Lincoln Belmont Booster? No. Uh, I keep forgetting the name. Um, they they had a bunch of North Side. Yeah. Yeah. They all came. They, they all had an office on Milwaukee that's Avenue. That's right. Mm-hmm. Peacock. Yeah. Peacock. Right. The Peacock called. papers. Peacock, that was yeah. really big when I was yeah. a kid in the 50s yeah. and That 60s. was up in was your that a area. But of a paper? <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> you. but down in the Lakeview <laughs> down in the Lakeview area. Then was there was Lerner and Lerner. Leader. Yeah, Lerner. Now Natick is about the only one left. Northwest side, yeah. Then you got the Herald out in I, the suburbs. Uh, oh yeah, that's big. I don't know why they do it, but I've got a little side job <laughs> at the Shaker building on Saturday. Shaker the, building? Yeah, 1100 Lake Street. Mm, and yeah. the Tribune always dumps off five Sunday papers there Saturday morning. I don't know why. Only five? Like yeah, only five. And That's interesting. Now, and now I ask people to want them, so I got a route inside the building for the five papers that You make any want. money doing this or no? No, oh, but I mean, like, <laughs> if you're out of a certain area, it's like five bucks for this Sunday Tribune and four, oh, $3.99 yeah. for... Uh, in the city, 
I think the Trib wants four bucks outside the city for their daily paper. In the in the city, it's now two ninety nine. Now I think it's three ninety nine and four ninety nine. Our now. producer that, wants to make a point. Okay, now, ranks uh, all okay. Yeah. Yeah. now in this area, now here here in Norwich and Harwood Heights, we got the uh, uh, um, what's that? Uh, the Pioneer Press. That's right, right John. Yeah, yeah. yeah we I got the Pioneer Press, yeah. And, yeah. and we get the Harlem, uh, uh, Harlem, um, or the Har- Harwood Heights uh, Norge paper here at the uh, here at the studios right. here. Yeah, right, right. Yep. And the Tribune, you know, the Tribune never had syndicated columnists. They never had outside columnists. Uh, they had their own columnists, like Walter Trohan oh, had a column in the Tribune. Not syndicated. They had, but if you think about it, that's why it always fascinated me when, like, the American, for example, they had all these columnists. Like, Barry Goldwater had a column when I was a kid you in the American. Yeah. I remember coming home from school. Late 50s, my grandmother so, yeah. got the afternoon paper, the Herald American, and they would have a column by Barry Goldwater and a man named Henry J. Taylor. <laughs> always wrote about foreign policy and the and the gold outflow, and we're getting a signal. I've, I've been it's watching time, the clock. It's time. And ladies and gentlemen, here is our announcer. Because we'll be right back after these messages of interest and importance. Not only interesting, but important. Right back. Well, friends, today is October the 15th, and old man winter is not that far away, unfortunately. And before he arrives, and we get that heavy snow, ice, rainstorms, you might want to check the roof and siding and gutters on your home. So be sure that the roof Siding and gutters on your home are in real good shape for the winter time that's not that far away. You don't want mold or mildew in your attic or crawl space, or you don't want drip, drip, drip on the ceilings in your rooms, or have walls damaged by a leaky gutter or bad siding. So don't have double expense. Sooner or later, it's going to have to be taken care of. So, call Best Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters at area code 630-616-1359. Mike Best will drive over in his shiny red truck with ladders on top. And he'll look over your roof, siding, and gutters, give you an estimate, and go from there. So don't have double expense. Call Best Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters for a free estimate at area code 630-616-1359. That's Best Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters at area code 630-616-1359. Call today for a free estimate. Again, call Mike Best, Best Brothers Roofing, at area code 630-616-1359 for a free estimate. Now, back to our discussion. John? Well, thank you, Rich, and we're here again. Let's go around the table and give everybody an opportunity to introduce themselves. I'll begin to my right with our fire department expert, Bill. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, Tell us who you are, Bill. Bill Kugelman, and uh, I was, uh, yes, I was on the fire department, retired as chief of the 10th Battalion, and also president of the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago, of which you have a special we day have an coming up. Open house this, uh, Ooh, yeah. the, or not this Saturday, but the Saturday after the 27th, and uh, we are open from 10 until 2. And we invite everyone, everyone's welcome, 5218 Southwestern Avenue. Right. Plenty of parking, good parking, uh, nobody bothers you, <laughs> and uh, we'd love to have you there. Uh, admission is free, of course, and uh, that's about it. It's a great place to visit. We did it. We did an, oh. we did an episode of this show some years ago at, at a remote 
at the fire museum and I had a chance to browse around both floors and look at all the exhibits and display Correct. cases. And it's very interesting. It's very well worth the trip and, and teaches you some of the importance of the fire service to the city and to every city and uh, and the heritage of, of our Chicago Fire Department. You know, so one, of our, one of our members of this group, the Chicago Historians, was also one of the one of the first members to put the fire museum together, and that's Ken Little. Sure. Yeah. And we have dedicated the second floor to Ken Little, right. and we call it the Ken Little Library. And, right. uh, uh, of course, it's a library with all the records in and, and so forth. And uh, we miss Ken very much. He's a great guy. You know, guys, great member of this panel. Just, just last week, last Wednesday, was October the 10th, and at 11.30, when we were on the air at the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago, oh, yes. Dr. Wayne Chukowitz called me and told me that Joe Gentile had passed away. At seven years, last Wednesday, that Joe had passed on. Wow. Well. I can't believe it. That seven years have already gone. And, of course, this show originated at the old WJJG, Joseph J. Gentile, the call letters, and... John was a good friend of his. John was the station manager there and the electrician and, and, and did everything and hosted shows. And I got my start uh, doing a morning show there. So uh, WJJG and uh, very sad occasion. We yeah. were there at the Fire Museum when we learned that uh, Joe had yeah. passed away. Oct October the 10th, uh, the year uh, that, that, he, 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 that Joe passed away. And also... October the 10th of 1958 is when I started with Illinois Bell Telephone Company. Oh, oh. very good. So October 10th, 10th <laughs> 10 means 10. a lot to me. That means 10-10, right. the 10th day of the 10th month. Oh. Right. Bill has to break away, so we're losing one one member of our panel. Right. So uh, we thank Bill. Uh, Two for members, being, actually. Being, yeah, yeah. And what, what, is your, what is your friend's name? Kate. Ruff. Kate. It's, Kate. It's, it's my girl, Kate. She's Kate <laughs> is the mascot right. of our, of our uh, Meet the Chicago Historian, the fine right. little dog that, uh, that uh, the Bill brings with, with him all the time. So right. thanks for being with us, Bill, and have, a, you, very, Bill. have a happy Halloween. Speaking, happy of the, Halloween right. speaking of the museum, last Tuesday, Chicago Fire filmed a uh, scene there. It'll air on November the 7th. Seventh, right. But at the museum? To do about 50 seconds, it took them like 13 and a half hours. Oh, God. Yeah. I can yeah. believe that. Yeah. Yeah. And they had yeah. trucks from one end of the block to the other, and I don't know how many people outside trying to get, I don't know, autographs or something. I don't know. Well, while Bill is here, I'll give him a little Halloween greeting. It goes. <laughs> 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 Wow, I'm scared. <laughs> Don't Take go care, away, Bill. Matt. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Bill Kugelman, uh, Here you go. stalwart member of the Chicago sure. Fire Department, and uh, one of the founding members of our panel on Meet the Chicago Historians. Glad to have him. Glad to have him with us. I was going to mention you talked about Sidney Harris. I used to like Sidney Harris's column. He would periodically do a column called. Things I learned on the way to looking up something else. That sounds familiar. And he would have maybe mm -hmm. 8 or 10 or 12 little facts. And I, I've had this experience where I'll pick up an encyclopedia and I'll be looking for something and I'll see another heading and I'll read that before I get to what I started. And it's true, you will learn something completely different than what you went to the book to look up. Mm -hmm. And that's what apparently happened to him, either in a dictionary or an encyclopedia, back when people used books for that purpose and <laughs> not the internet necessarily but you could you could literally open a book and see something there that you thought gee that's interesting it's not what you opened the book for yeah so he would have eight or ten yeah. things that he had learned that way and he would make a column he would make up a column out of, of those things things i learned on the way to looking up something else and you do that maybe once every two or three weeks but he was more of a philosopher, yes, I think. Yes. Than, uh, yeah, I, I'd like yeah. to review some he of his columns. He wasn't a political yeah. columnist, per se. He just had sort of a, a look at life and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and oh, the yeah. way things develop. But he was, he was an excellent columnist. As I say, the Tribune didn't have columnists of that type. They just had their in-house people. They had this column, which I guess still exists, called In the Wake of the News. That sounds right. That was one of the headings, and, and people would come, you know, someone would have the column for years and then retire, and then another person would get that column in the wake of the news. 
And they had a they had a sports column too. Um, they had a heading of that type on the sports page, uh, which again I can't think of it right off the top of my head. But they had a a continuing column mm. that would be held for some years, and then it would be inherited by somebody mm. else. And I'm forgetting the paper now, but those long running columnist, I think it was Doctor Brady, get all kinds of medical advice. Oh, okay. Like take quinine for uh, leg cramps at night, which I think helped me to some degree. Well, when I was reading, when, when I would, when I was in school, and I would, we would get the. Uh, I was got my grandmother got the the American, the, the Herald American. My mother, my mother always called it the Herald American. When I was a kid, it was called the Chicago American. Chicago's American. And then, but they said, no. At first, it was just the Chicago American, and then they decided to make it a little more more Possessive human there. interest. So they made okay. it Chicago's okay. American. Chicago's American, and it wound up they called it Chicago Today. They turned right, it into yeah. a tabloid. Yeah. And that was the end. That car sort of sank because it didn't last very long as Chicago today. And then it went right. out of. Uh, it was owned by the Tribune, by the way. Right. It, it, was, it was published by the Tribune. It was an af- For those who are not familiar, it was what was called an afternoon newspaper. Right. Because papers came out in the morning. And in, those, in the days before television and in the days even before radio was doing much news, right. uh, mm-hmm. people think news was always a staple of radio. It wasn't. News was not that big a thing on radio, particularly world news. Uh, CBS began what they called the World News Roundup in like 1938. I think this year was the, the 80th anniversary of what they called the World News Roundup. And that was really the beginning of a network doing overseas news. And they would bring in these correspondents from London and Paris and Berlin and so forth. And the war added to that, of course. Right, right. Yeah, were, yeah, and yeah. Things, things were happening in Europe with Hitler and Mussolini sure. and Chamberlain. But the point I'm making is there wasn't all that much news on radio in the, in the 20s, even 30s. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted to know what happened since the morning, you couldn't turn the radio on. Because it might be forever before you'd find right. news. They had afternoon papers. There was another paper no. that came out in the afternoon. And that's what the, the American was. And that's what the Daily News was. Right. They were afternoon papers. And in those days, too, they had several editions. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The youngsters wouldn't know what that means. Uh, ex- well, yeah, the, they the, had one of them just for, for horse race results, yeah. didn't they? And, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the five. Remember, they'd have the five-star star final. The, right. They would that's have right. little stars in the corner right. of the paper yeah. that told you how which edition this was. The first edition, the second, right. the third. The five apparently five was it. That was the right. five, that was the last edition the, for the day. The first one was one star, and then right. they kept going. And I remember it would say up in the corner, five star final. The word mm-hmm. final. Right. So like, get it now, folks. This right. is the last paper coming out right. today. I think the only rem- remnant of that now are your Sunday papers, which often come out with earlier editions on Saturday. Right. And then yes. And, and then you get the look for the word final when you buy a paper Sunday morning. Sunday you know morning. you're getting the last well, one. Yeah. The first edition of the the Sunday one come out comes out on Saturday morning. Pretty early. I yeah, wonder why they yeah. want to come out yeah, so it's early. Already, yeah. Yeah. It's already in the, it's already they, in the stores. They Saturday got all the morning. advertising and all that oh, stuff yeah. in there. Speaking of radios, Mutual, was that basically a news... Ooh. A MBS. news magazine, or newspaper rather, or news radio rather than a I don't NBC know. and ABC? Except that if you see the old pictures of FDR when he's addressing the nation... And they would have all the microphones right. in front of him, yeah. and each one would have a little sign Logo. at the top, and it would say CBS, NBC, That's right. and then it would say MBS, and that was the mutual broadcasting system. And that was primarily news? I don't know. I, it may well be. It may well be. There was a mutual, it, 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 and even it, when I was a kid, there was still a mutual network. I remember there was a state yeah. where stations yeah. were a mutual. That a, this is WXXX, a mutual and broadcast. And news focus seems yeah, like was. Whether Pre- that was true then, predominantly I don't know. during the war, you heard from right. them. Maybe because they had overseas connections or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Then there was something called the Blue Network, well, th- which I think evolved into ABC. That's right. If you see war. those yeah. pictures of FDR, what you will not see is ABC. You know, we think of CBS, NBC, ABC as the traditional O line networks, but ABC did not exist in the 30s or during World War II. NBC had, as I understand, they had two networks. There was NBC Blue and NBC Red. I'm wondering why the two networks. And I, I, uh, I've never researched this. Geographic, I'm not sure. I've never researched no. this, yeah, but yeah. then eventually one of them became the ABC network. Maybe they were. Maybe NBC was required to divest itself. Maybe they had too Could many be. stations, mm-hmm. right. and I trust sort of thing. But they were forced to divest them. I'm, I'm just speculating. Sure. But one of those networks, you'll see references to the Blue Network uh, when you listen to the old time radio. Something they will say, "This is the oh, Blue yeah. Network." Mm-hmm. You know. And I think these were two variations on NBC. I think you're right, John. And yeah. one of them, yeah. after the war, became 
ABC. Now, was Walter Cronkite, he was in Europe during the war, right? Walter Cronkite was, was rare in CBS in that he didn't start out as a radio broadcaster. You know, they talk about Murrow's Boys. Yeah. When, when, when I was a kid in the 50s, all these correspondents on the CBS Evening News were all Murrow's Boys. They were all guys like uh-huh. David Schoenbrunn and Richard C. Hotlet. that all, They had all started off, and uh, Eric Severide, they had oh, all yeah. been part of radio broadcasting with Murrow going back to World War II. Right. But Cronkite was a newspaper guy. Cronkite, I think, was with the Associated Press. Okay. Or UPI, Sounds one right. of the two. Sounds right. And he was a war correspondent, but not for CBS. He was a newspaper correspondent okay. in the war, in World War II. You've probably seen these pictures of a young Cronkite in a right. you know, military uniform. And now, he was just my mother's age, so he'd be quite young. He was born in 1916. He was, a, he so was he'd be a, in his early 20s. He right. was a younger yeah. guy than yeah. Sean Brennan and Hoddle yeah. and, 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 and Murrow and all yeah. the rest of these guys. So he came into CBS then after World War II. So he was like the young kid on okay. the block. And uh, made a name for himself because by the mid-50s, he's already doing the conventions. And I remember from Cron- Cronkite. Oh, yeah. He was kind of sort of a political special. I think Cronkite right. politics sort of became his specialty, where these other guys were more foreign correspondents. Right. Competition to Huntley and Brinkley. Yeah. And he was he would yeah. do the conventions. I remember in 60, I remember as a kid that, that Walter Cronkite and, and Edward R. Murrow were the, the two co-anchors for the, the CBS convention coverage. Mm-hmm. And C- Murrow was sort of the old, the grand old, yeah. you know, he was the head of CBS News. I mean, he was CBS News. And in those days, they were covering conventions gavel to gavel. Gavel to gavel. Right. You turn, they were on in the Morning afternoon. I evening. remember that. Yes, yeah. I remember and the Kennedy one. it was fun. One. Yeah. It was fun. Was you know, the that. idea of watching a convention was a big deal. Oh. Right. And, you know, years, they'd yeah. be out on the floor interviewing this delegation and that del- And it was right. exciting. It was right. you know, to see this stuff live. Now they cover maybe an hour. Right. You know, uh, the, from 9 to 10, they come on. They do one speech. one, And the, the parties deliberately schedule their, their premier speaker at, at 9 o'clock. And, so yeah, they'll be on during the prime time. Prime time. I guess the cable... I think there are cable stations that still do them gavel to gavel. I think you're right. CNN I, or some yeah, I will do it gavel to Remember gavel. it, and I don't know what it was. It may have been with the Kennedy, but they had this new invention where they could walk around with a TV yeah, camera on a, their shoulder. They were gigantic Ooh. equipment. But it was on there, and they, yeah. they didn't have to stay in. <laughs> right. In, they didn't, have to go to, TV they didn't have to go to the uh, camera. The camera came to them. I was a delegate to the to the 1988. I was re, I was a Republican delegate to the 1988 Republican convention in New Orleans, as they pronounce it down there. New Orleans. One of the great experiences of my life. But I got to see all the boots, and you say, you know, as a kid, you'd see wow. the, and, and I saw all of the boots up there, and they all have their logo. You know, the right. CBSI and NBC and ABC. Yeah. And the one thing that impressed me was. Uh, I was never a big fan of Dan Rather. I must have been. I, I gotta say, I gotta say a plug for Dan Rather. Mm. When they they would start every every session of the of the convention with the national anthem, and Dan Rather without fail would up in the booth. He's not on the air. Nobody. He would always stand for the national anthem, which wasn't true. Many of these other correspondents were talking to somebody mm. or right. they're getting ready and everything. But Dan, and, and I would look up there deliberately. I would turn my and Dan Rather would always stand for the national anthem, and I give him credit for that. I say a lot of things I didn't like about his political view, but I, I, I salute him for that. He always stood for the national anthem. But uh, Huntley and Brinkley did the conventions in '56. I think that was the beginning of the Huntley Brinkley Report. They were like a big hit. They, they were on forever. They took the ratings oh, away God. from CBS. I think that the, whoever You're CBS, right. they they were the, the for the first time that CBS was not the ratings leader in anything. I think, and that was the beginnings of putting them together on a, a, a nightly newscast, which became the Huntley Brinkley Report, which was very big in the sixties and seventies. I remember it. I th- Maybe you guys can remember too when the typical TV news length was only fifteen minutes. Right. Absolutely. Or later on, maybe a half first, hour. Before a Cronkite, Cronkite was nationwide, the main CBS news leader in the early 60s. Douglas Edwards. You got it, John. Douglas, Douglas Edwards. Edwards. When Don't I was a kid, you'd have 15 minutes of local news. Right. Uh, and 15 minutes of world news or national yes, news. So. And, and Doug, Douglas Edwards with the news. And they'd have that like a teletype going right. in the background. Got a good memory. And for a, a while, they just had him on the morning 
in the night, and then sometime of that, sometime they got in the afternoon at noon time. Right. But that well, that was a while. Mostly the news at noon was all local. All local, yeah. The like only WGN the, the, yeah, the, and the network it was there was it, and I think it came on. Uh, it seems to me it, it came on at, at like five thirty for fifteen minutes. Right. And it was it was in this it was during the Kennedy administration that they went to half right. an hour. That and they went they to would, half an hour of, of network news. And then they would break in with some kind of news and they were mm. they would say it and they say the right you would basically they said you had to wait until the the news hour in the evening. A little teaser sort of Yeah. And you have to remember the news consisted mainly of a guy as reading we're doing paper. right here, sitting in front of a microphone, just reading, and maybe they'd have a, a still photo in the back. If they'd say President Eisenhower, they maybe they'd put up a picture of President right. Eisenhower. But they did, there was no videotape. Vi- you know, vid- videotape was in its beginnings in the late right. beginning in the late fifties. But they didn't have satellite. They didn't have on the scene. They, were, they didn't say, "Now we take you to our man in New York." They couldn't do that. They didn't right. technically That's have right. the ability to do that stuff in those days. Remember being right. on a trip it was to New kind York of City in fifty two when you could watch. <coughs> Through a big window and watch somebody like David Garraway on the Today right, Show. Right, right. And I, I forget now how they incorporated news in that program. They must have had some news segments. Well, they had uh, Jack Lescooley. Jack Lescooley. Jack Lescooley. Right. I think yeah. Lescooley did the news. That I sounds think Lescooley right. did the news. Name out of the past. And they had what was called the Today Girl. They would have a girl on who was the co like the co anchor with, with Dave Garraway. Right. Was she doing weather or something? She ba- mainly was just adding. She mainly was just adding beauty to the show. I mean, they would do feature no, stories. No, they wouldn't do that. That wouldn't yeah. be politically <laughs> correct today. I ask. I'm saying you couldn't get away. But they, uh, uh, what's her name? Um, one of the current, um, current. Oh God, she's been on television. Just shows how long she's been on the air. Barbara Walters right, was, a, t- was one of the one of the last Today the girls. Right. She was no. a Today girl, not in not with Garraway. I think it was later. It was in the '60s that she was the Today girl. Well, there was one that started in Chicago on Channel Seven with, uh, hmm. and now she's a big news anchor on NBC. Uh, Ooh. I can't remember. I, I don't, uh, she was when uh, John Coleman and those other Finn guys. Finn Daly, Frank and Coleman. Right. Eyewitness News. Frank and Coleman would sort of play tricks at each other. I mean, yeah, I don't one, remember, he I don't said remember that if you want to bet, he would s- do the news standing on his Happy talk. Do, happy do, talk, do happy the talk. news standing on his head, and there he is on the news. Or no, on so the like Coleman doing the weather. Yeah. On his head. <laughs> John right. Coleman was a, 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 a beloved figure, I think, in right. Chicago television. And he television. started yeah. the Weather Channel. Yeah. John Coleman. It was in, in, the, in the late 60s, in I think about 67 uh, ABC, uh, d- the local w- WBKB, now WLS, right. came up with Flynn Daily News with right. Fahey Flynn, Flynn, who was the longtime CBS anchor, not CBS Network, but the sh- local Chicago right. uh, version of it. And uh, uh, Fahey Flynn and Bill Frink was the sportscaster. Right. And John Coleman did the weather, and Joel Daly, who's still around, he right. pops up usually for the St. Patrick's Day parade on ABC. Right. And uh, he th- that was, and they called it Eyewitness News. Eyewitness News. Eyewitness. Yeah, Witless. sometimes <laughs> called it Eyewitness. <laughs> but it was they wanted to loosen up the news a little bit and make it right. more fun. It's ki- it's kind of commonplace now. They all have teams. All every station has right. four or five or six people doing the news. Right. Now going back a little earlier than that, the first well-known weatherman on network tv pj hoff pj hoff and invariably Fahey he would say what's the outlook pj what's the outlook every every evening yeah. he would say what's the outlook pj <laughs> and who was and pj would just draw was things the he was the vice president in charge of looking out the window that was him that, that pj hoff was not a media like today they say a <gasps> meteor now you got to be a meteorologist he was no tom skilling that's what yeah. i know no he was just a cartoonist he was a yeah. cartoonist that would draw <laughs> yeah cartoons. he would yeah i remember and, i mean anybody could tell you what the temperature was the weather was going to rain tomorrow right <clears throat> no radar, no satellites. Yeah. They didn't have satellites. They pictures. had a window. Right. <laughs> and they stuck the window. Yeah. Well, the story is that he once said it's going to be clear today. It's, you know, no problem this evening, folks. We have clear weather. And it was pouring rain as he's saying <laughs> this. And the station slid up with phone calls, you know, while he said, it's going to be a beautiful evening, folks. Right. <laughs> had his little son up on the, right. on the cartoon. 
and it's raining cats and dogs outside. So that was the origin of the vice president in charge of looking right. out the window. He was never going to make that mistake again. Right. So he would look out the window before he went on the air. <laughs> Very <laughs> so, up to date. He was probably a lot more accurate than they are today. Mr. And then he had another character called Mr. Yellen Cuss. Mr. Yellen Cuss. It was a guy who was always so, was some angry little guy who was always complaining about the weather. Okay, I don't remember that. See, there's not too that. much technology here no. in those days. <laughs> so you had to do something to jazz up the weather, and they... A lot of stations would have a cartoonist doing the But they doing could the do weather. that because the whole news thing was only 15 minutes. And remember, so they'd be lucky if they got two or three minutes on say, it. They, right. had no, right. they had no right. radar. No, They didn't know what was going to happen other than the usual weather you know, the right. usual <laughs> weather bureau stations and so forth. And the farmer's so they, almanac. They essentially told you what the temperature was and whether they thought it was going to rain tomorrow mm-hmm. or not. There was no, There were no... I don't think they had five days, seven day forecasts, oh, no. and they couldn't tell you what the weather was going to be no, in seven no. days. And they still can't tell you what the weather's going to be in seven do. days. <laughs> they do, even <laughs> right. whether they can or not, whether they can or not. Wow. So uh, it's great memories of of the way television has changed over the years, and right. the way that the way broadcasting the news has changed. Right. And I remember that until the middle sixties, everything was only in black and white. Oh sure. Right. Yeah. NBC had color in the 50s, but er- it wasn't, everything wasn't in color, and very few people had color TVs. Right. Oh, I remember my grandmother had one when we went there early in the morning to see the test pattern because that was in one of the few things that were in <laughs> color. And then every once in a while you get a commercial in color, and I don't know what the, reg- the first regularly uh <laughs> color one maybe it was in the 50s nbc was broadcasting in color because remember you remember of course the peacock which is t- right. still the, 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 the uh, one of the logos of NBC. it's now it, universal nbc yeah. peacock and uh, in chicago uh, could take trips to the museum of science and industry and see what color tv would yeah. look like yeah back in the late 40s into the 50s uh, wttw started there in the kill the time remember they had monitors and you can watch yourself going by on the monitor yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what w TTW yeah. in the afternoon, you can see people walking by in the museum looking and in the monitor. We all know what WTTW stands for. What? Tell us, uh, Rich, what does WTTW Why? for a $15, if this may be a state, Rich? Why? How about window to the world? You're right, Rich. And what is Rich's prize going to be, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, John, we I have a, a, a two-week <laughs> trip for three to Harwood Heights, ladies and gentlemen, for, 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 for answering that question. If you're lucky, right, you right. might even be able to go to Berwyn. That's right. <laughs> See, John, when you were uh, like reintroducing some of us before, before you got to me, I would have said, I've taught history. That's right. I, I go back to the good old days, and more and more I live in the past. <laughs> That's right. When newspapers only cost a nickel. And you think, you know, they talk about senior citizens. You know, Uh-oh. well, 99% of their memories come from the past. Well, most yeah, people. I'll, I'll vouch most, for that. Most people, you know. If you remember the TV show Banachek, which is not that, it's not, not, we're not talking about the 1950s. The Banachek was on in the early to mid 70s. And he was, it was George Peppard. George played, Peppard. Right. played oh, a yeah, private yeah. eye, and he was of Polish ancestry. <laughs> and he lived in, he, he was a very wealthy, erudite man. And this, this girlfriend, he was always, he was, he was uh, fine with the ladies. This was, the premier episode, this girl comes hmm. to his home. And he's got this oak-paneled library with leather-bound books and, and, you know, china and paintings. And she says, and she's very, she's one of these with it, you know, the, the 60s and 70s. She says, why do you have all this old stuff here? You must like everything old. <laughs> and he says, you know, there are hundreds of years of old and only a couple of years of now. I'll take what's old. There's not oh, even a ye- of now. <laughs> yeah. There's not about. even a... Uh, now is in the seconds. Well, he was being a little charitable, yeah. but he says I prefer what's old. And I was, I always like, I was like, old way. on. I can't remember U T U T V or B T V or MeTV? something. At three o'clock in the morning or something, like, they've got a program where this guy gets a newspaper for the next day. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that was early edition. Early, early, yeah, early edition. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Good premise for a show. It, yeah. it didn't last too long, no. but I remember. Yeah, and there was one guy who always wanted to get his newspaper because he he wanted to play the horses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get. Yeah, that. man, you know that's the dream. If you could get the sports results, if you could get the stock market results right. a day ahead of time, yeah. think of I don't know if they had anything on the do. program, but. <laughs> yeah. He had things that were going on, you know. Or another fun program, more recently, Quantum Leap. 
I don't remember. That was another time shifting. He would, he would just leap and kind of indiscriminately go from one time to but he had to another. become another person. In doing yeah, yeah. He, he didn't go there as himself. Inhabited another body. He would and, become yeah. another that's person. Right, that's yeah. right. Well, didn't that was a Einstein good say <laughs> you cannot travel? Time travel is impossible. I thought he said that no, it would. Time travel. He is says impossible. as you got closer you to the speed of light, time, time will slow time up. Will time slow will down. slow down. All time mechanical sure. or clocks mechanical and human Darn. will you can, slow down in your. Field of vision would get narrower. Yeah, and narrower. but if you can conceive of building a device that could travel at the speed of light, a hundred and eighty-six thousand mm, miles, miles per, per second. second. Think, I mean, the, the fastest things that we have. You know, we have satellites that that can can circle the Earth in ninety minutes. I mean, it's like twenty-five thousand miles. They can do that in ninety minutes. Right. I mean, the speeds we're talking about. Are are nothing compared to 186. It is impossible for, with anything like our our technology. And and with that thought on technology, folks, we've been reminded of the technology of the clock, a very ancient technology yes. of the clock. In a very and, and, and technology. I, I, I turn the I turn the microphone over to our crack announcer. Crack. Now for another brief and perhaps our last intermission. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. Hello friends, do you need new tires for your vehicle? How are the brakes? Are they in good condition? How's your front wheel alignment? Do you need your tires rotated? How are the shocks and struts? Do you need an oil and grease change? How about a tune-up? When was the last time you had your engine tuned up? How about the wiper blades? Are they nice sharp blades to clean off the rain and snow? How are the headlights, tail lights, stop lights, turn directional signals? Are all the bulbs working? How's your cooling system and the exhaust system? How about your battery? Does that need to be upgraded? How about the belts and hoses? Fuel injectors? Timing belt and chain and the air conditioning. Is that all working properly? Well, if you need any maintenance work done on your vehicle, go to Grand Tire and Auto Service which is located at 7034 West Grand Avenue in Chicago. They are on Grand Avenue on the north side of the street, about two blocks east of Harlem Avenue. You can't miss the building. There's a big Goodyear sign right on top of the building. Or you can call area code 773-622-4361. Don Chris or Ken will be more than happy to assist you and to help you with any questions you might have about the maintenance on your vehicle. Their hours are Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 7 o'clock in the evening, Saturday from 7.30 in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and even on Sunday from 9.30 in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So once again, for any maintenance work you might need on your vehicle, go to Grand Tire and Auto Supply. Once again, their address is at 7034 West Grand Avenue in Chicago, about two blocks east of Harlem Avenue on the north side of the street. And their phone number is area code 773-622-4361. They have great service. Their mechanics are all certified mechanics, and they do quality work. Now, I've been going to Grand Tire with my vehicle since 1985, right up until this present day. So once again, Grand Tire and Auto Service at 7034 West Grand Avenue in Chicago. Their phone number is 773 622 4361. Don, 
Chris and Ken will be more than happy to help you and to advise you on any maintenance work you might need on your vehicle. So once again, Grand Tire and Auto Service at 7034 Grand Avenue in Chicago, about two blocks east of Harlem Avenue on the north side of the street. You can't miss the building because there's a big Goodyear sign on the top of the building. That's Grand Tire and Auto Service, 7034 Grand Avenue in Chicago, and their phone number is area code 773-622-4367. Six, one. For quality service, it's Grand Tire Auto Service, 7034 Grand Avenue in Chicago, 773-622-4361. Now back to our show, John. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed our, our topic for our first two hours has been the Chicago Sports Championships, and I hope... <laughs> I hope you've been enlightened by all the, uh, the, uh, the, the really pertinent information we've brought to the table today about our hockey and basketball. The, the fact of the matter is, folks, I, I, I think maybe I can speak for the three of us, and I think also for the two gentlemen who left. And that uh, Go for it. None, go of, for none it. of us really considers ourselves, our, considers himself, to be uh, that much of an expert, particularly when it comes to hockey and basketball championships. I mm -hmm. certainly admit that I'm not. And uh, the, the, the man who set our, our topic for today uh, perhaps was, but uh, he's not here. And so we haven't spent a great deal of time. Uh, I think actually we've spent no time at all <laughs> talking about Chicago sports championships. And that may continue during this, the final 25 minutes of our show today, right. folks. But I'm sure maybe we may come back at a future mm -hmm. date when we will have... Uh, uh, a wealth of information available for you. The only thing I, I, I remember the 1950, I suppose we should say a little bit. I remember the yeah. 59 White Sox, and I remember the night they clinched the pennant oh, in yeah. Cleveland, and I remember the sirens being set off right. uh, by a fire com a good a man who I think, I think our producer knew, Fire Commissioner Quinn. Quinn. Who uh, had a good friend. He's just signaling me. They were mm -hmm. his good friend. He was the legendary Fire He was the Chicago Fire Department, what J. Edgar Hoover was to the FBI. I mean, he was Mr. Chicago Fire Department. Right. And he turned on the sirens that night, which caused all sorts of consternation because this was the height of the Cold War, and people yeah. thought it meant we were under nuclear attack. But he was celebrating the Sox clinching the pennant right. uh, in Cleveland. I remember watching the game. I remember the game was a night game from Cleveland. And then the Sox went into the World Series that year against the then Los Angeles Dodgers, which had just moved to the coast. Right, right. It was, I think, their second year. Right. I think, I think, '58 was their first year on the coast, and they won the they won the pennant. Right. They won the National League pennant in '59, and the White Sox played them and lost the uh, the World Series to uh, to the Los Angeles Dodgers. And uh, that was the first time that the Sox had been in a World Series since 1919, since the famous Black Sox mm -hmm. right. scandal of Shoeless Joe Jackson and uh, and uh, Comiskey, you know, and and the the the, the grand the old Roman Comiskey, who mm -hmm. was the owner of the team. So first time in 40 years the Sox had won the pennant. It was a, it was as big a deal. I mean, when you think of the the Cubs, it was was a century. The Cubs <laughs> went a century right. without winning. Without winning a without winning the World Series, uh, they had they had been in, they had been in the uh, in 1945. Right, I think right, was the last right. time they had won the pennant before the recent occasion. But it was a big deal that the White Sox and this was the the White Sox of Early Win uh, right. was their star pitcher and great uh, name for a pitcher Early Win and win. they had their double play combination of shortstop Louis Aparicio. And my hero as a kid, second baseman Nelson Fox. Nelly Fox. He was number two, and Aparicio was number 11. And Sherman Lawler was mm -hmm. the catcher for the White Sox at that at that time. And Jungle Jim Rivera, I believe, was their center fielder. Was he center fielder? I think was the center right. fielder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so this was it was a great team. Mm -hmm. And their re their star relief pitcher was Omar Turk Lown. Omar Ooh, Turk Lown was their great relief pitcher for the White Sox. So it was it was a terrific team. Mm -hmm. And uh and don't forget the manager of the Sox. Was year. was uh, the, they called him the Happy Hidalgo. Was one of the things that the Tribune Never called. heard that one. The Happy, Happy Hidalgo, Hidalgo which okay. is a Spanish nobleman is a Hidalgo. Is that right? 
Al Lopez. There you go. Was the manager of the Chicago (laughs) Senior. That was another title he gave him. Senior Lopez. Interesting. Was the manager. And this, of course, was, uh, you know, the the grand old days of the White Sox. The Comiskey family were still part owners of the Sox. Right. And, uh, but this mm-hmm. was uh, Bill Veck. Mm-hmm. Bill mm-hmm. Veck was the owner of the Sox, and he had added a lot of, he added a lot of pizzazz to the White Sox, uh, including the exploding scoreboard, which I think oh, came yeah. in the following year. I don't think they had the exploding scoreboard in 59. That sounds right, John. I think yeah, it came yeah. in the following yeah. year, the, which, which was, a, nobody had exploding scoreboards. Now everybody <laughs> right. fires off rockets, but, but the, sh- the Sox. Was but it, anyway, those are my memories of the 1959 no. White Sox. Was it Bill Veck? It was either him or his father put up the scoreboard in Wrigley Field. I think planted the ivy in Wrigley or Field. Could be. Yeah. Could Because yeah. Beck, yeah. Beck had been in... Beck Late had, 30s. Beck had yeah. been in baseball. He was the one who sent a midget up to the plate. Right. For, for these, the old St. Louis Browns, who right, were one right. of the... The, the they were the well, people in the 60s remember the New York Mets were the bottom of the barrel right the St. Louis Browns were the bottom of the right. barrel in, in professional baseball major and league I heard baseball it, it did because the strike zone was so much smaller <laughs> yeah, right between the belt and the letters and <laughs> if the guy was only four feet high and the, they found out there was no rule that prevented it there was nothing right. in the nothing in the rules that prevented Not until it. then there was no height requirement or, or weight requirement right. or anything and he had checked he apparently had checked this out because the opposing team came out screaming you can't do this oh, right but he said Eddie Guidel I think the name of the midget was Eddie Guidel wow. was was the midget that that was sent to the plate. It was like 1946. I'm going to say right. thereabouts mm-hmm. that he sent a midget. But Bill Veck was a showman. He was right. he, was, he was the P.T. Barnum of <laughs> base of baseball. And then he let his wife design the uniforms. Remember with the socks right across the oh, front. Yeah. Oh yeah, that sounds on. familiar. Yeah. yeah. And then did he come he out? He came with back a second time. He sold the socks right. and then he came back again and owned them again in later years. Right. But and when he came back in later years, he decided he was going to make yellow baseball so he can see them better? I think you're confusing. Sounds with owner. the Cubs. That was, that was um, uh, uh, the owner of the Oakland A's. That was oh, Charlie Finley. Sure. Okay, okay. Charlie mm-hmm. Finley was the one that introduced the colored colored baseball. Right. Mm-hmm. The reason, my recollection is that when when uh, the father of, of, of the then, ch- the younger Chuck Comiskey had died, there was a squabble in the family. and There was a woman named Rigney. There was a, the, he had a daughter who was a Comiskey, and she was married to a man named Rigney, and they had the controlling interest in the Sox. They had like 51% of the stock, and Comiskey had 49 And the Rigney sold controlling interest to Bill Veck. And that was how Veck came in. That was how the Comiskey ownership ended okay. in the late 50s, because the Comiskeys had owned the team from the old Romans days right uh-huh. down until right. the 1950s. So Vec came in. There was a lot of bitterness at the time. I remember people felt that you know the Comiskey family should have continued, right. the, the Chuck Comiskey Jr. Right. or the third, whatever he was, that he should have run. The, there was a lot of controversy about Vec being an outsider coming in right. and owning the Sox. But I've been. Anybody else like to add to this? I'm, I'm I remember when he when he bought it the second time on opening day. He had he had a wooden leg and he was playing the flute and your other was playing the drums and st- on opening day he really had a wooden leg Bill yeah Bill, i know Bill, he, did. He, had a, right. he, he was injured i think in world war right. ii i think he had lost his leg right. in world war ii and his son still owns a couple or maybe just one minor league baseball does team. he young vec Vec's yeah son. Oh, hmm. okay that's interesting yeah. he wrote a biography called vec as in wreck that's right <laughs> vec I is in wreck. i didn't read it but i remember what you're talking because it was spelled v-e-e-c-k for those right. who don't remember so you might have pronounced it veek and i remember people calling him bill veek interesting but but it, <laughs> it was pronounced vec as in wreck do we know much of al lopez's career after the Sox's pennant win in 1959. I think he played with them for another year or two. He was the with them. He retired, and then he came back. Lopez retired after 59. Yeah? After yeah, he was with them. Is that may- right? Maybe in 60 or oh, okay. 61. Okay. But he did retire, and in the mid 60s, the Sox were in terrible shape. They were, and I don't remember who their manager was. Mm. But they brought him back. I think he was still with the organization. I think he still had a job with the organization. He may have been executive vice president or some title or other. And they brought him back as the field manager. And he was manager for a, a matter of days, I'm going to say. Oh. He had, I think he had ulcers. He had medic, and he just, he said he just couldn't do this. He just couldn't, couldn't take the aggravation. 
and he was out. They were playing in Kansas City or someplace, and he just said, "That's it." And he'd only been the manager for I'm going to say days, maybe a week, week and a half. I mean, it was a big fanfare <coughs> that when Vic, when 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 Lopez came back, and it was just a, a, a very short time later that he, he he just couldn't do it, and he and he, he turned and he said he just he, his health. He was I don't know how old he was, but he couldn't take hmm, the Aggers. The, the Sox had a terrible team, and they were being trounced. And I think he was succeeded by Eddie Stanky. I think that was that, that, was, really that was when Eddie fair. Stanky was brought in, who had a had been in baseball, right. had been kicking around for a few years. He had managed other clubs. And he became the manager of the Sox for a number of years in the in the later 60s. Then. Right. Mm-hmm. But Vec did come back for that brief, very brief return. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, Al, not Vec, uh, right. Lopez, Al Lopez. Uh, I think I've got my story straight. But later on after 1908 or something like that, the Cubs were playing the Yankees in a World Series. And they were at... Wrigley Field, and it, that's when Ooh. Babe Ruth supposedly did the cold home run. Oh, yeah. And everybody thought there was at, at Comiskey Park, and it was at Wrigley Field. Wrigley Field. The Yankees were playing the was Cubs. 30, the Cubs, were, I think, the Cubs yeah. were in a World Series, if you, if you can believe right. it. Though. The Cubs were but in a World supposedly Series. supposedly Babe Ruth promised this little boy that he would well, that's a different story. He hit a home run for him. And, and that's a different story. That that, a di- that, that's a different. That wasn't like the William same Bendix time. on the Babe Ruth Yeah, story. but this know. was, they were riding him. Everybody was riding him, and he had t- I think he had taken a couple of strikes. I think he had two R- strikes on Right. Him, and he gestured. And then did mm-hmm. they argue that he didn't? But, right. But I prefer, I'm a yeah. Babe Ruth fan. Called, I called home great, run, right. And he pointed, and bang, he knocked yeah. the ball right to, to where he had well, This pointed. was late in his career, too. And yeah. J- yeah. Jack Brickhouse used to say that there were like, you know, 30,000, 35,000 people in the park that day. And over the years, he had met at least 200,000 people <laughs> that were who insisted they were in the park when, when, <laughs> that, take, when that took place. So. Now she got a story, another colorful manager in Chicago baseball, Leo DeRocher. Oh, right. God, yes. <laughs> now he had. Did he blow the 69? No. No, no. more to it than that. No. I'm a Leo DeRocher fan. I mean, really? I, I, was a, I had never been a Cub fan. My uncle was a Cub fan. My dad and my grandfather were Sox fans. My godfather mm. was a Yankee fan. I've often told that. I like to tell that story. So I was exposed to all three teams. <laughs> but my, my dad was a Sox fan. I was a Sox fan. But when DeRocher came to the Cubs, I became a Cub fan. Because to me, DeRocher was that was like old that was like old time baseball. DeRocher, sure, right. DeRocher was from the era of 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 DiMaggio and Babe Ruth mm-hmm. and right. Lou Gehrig Jackie and, Robinson, and yeah, the Dodgers yeah, 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 and the yeah. Yankees. He was New York, and I don't know. I just thought this was he was colorful. And colorful, I beca- yes. I yeah. became. I can remember leaving. I was in college at the time, and I can remember. I may have even cut a class to, to get on this, <laughs> get on the the elevated, and go to Wrigley Field. I remember going out there with friends of mine, right. and the place was des- sometimes wasn't all that full. The le- the idea that the Cubs always packed them in is not true. Right. But uh, <clears throat> there were. But we would go there, and I just thought he took the Cubs from a perennial second division team. They were the always. So one sports writer said the second division Cubs. The always second division Cubs, right. and he made a contender out of him. He put nice. him in first place, right. and he Bill. almost won the pennant. No. No. And the, the the Cubs collapsed. Well, they collapsed. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody remembers. It was the month of August. They collapsed, right. and the Mets caught fire. But God, for a whole season, Cubs baseball was exciting, and the Cubs oh, were yeah. in it. And then all these people started jumping all over DeRocher because he didn't win the pennant. I mean, he took a team that was nothing That's right. and brought him within an eyelash of winning the pennant. That's right. And no. I just, I thought he was terrific. He was colorful. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, I was a, I loved DeRocher. He I came from New York, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Either yeah. the Mets or the Yankees. Well, he, well, he had managed. He had, man, he had been with the Dodgers. He'd been with the Giants. You know, he had, he, he had been with uh, other teams I throughout the years. I remember when he was there. But yeah. rumors of underworld connections, uh, I think, plagued him a little yeah, bit. Yeah, he was uh, a showboat. He was yeah. married to Lorraine Day. Oh, yeah, and he who was a big friends of Sinatra. Right. I mean, yeah. the whole, sure. After opening day, until the kids got out of school, there was hardly nobody in the at the ballpark. And the same thing after Labor Day until the end right. of the season. Right. Maybe they would have a 1,000 people there. DeRocher was to baseball. What Frank Sinatra was to entertainment. Ooh, I, mean, I like you that. You know, he was. He I was, like that. He right. was a showman. He yeah. was. He uh, was larger than life. He had right. this huge personality. Now, he was did, it DeRocher? Did he change places with the announcer? There was one 
No, Boudreaux no, you're thinking playing that, that was when Boudreau. Boudreau was up in the booth, and and they Boudreau went back briefly to manage the Cubs. Right, and that lasted for about a week. Yeah, yeah. and that was another. That was like Lopez's return. It didn't work. Right, and, and because Boudreau had been, of course, a great ball player. Was it the Cubs who had like rotating managers? They had or? a college of coaches. That's for, it. That's they had right. they had a college of coaches. They didn't have college a manager in the okay. '60s. They didn't have a manager. They had they called it a college of coaches. And then from that, they, they had like one, then they decided that didn't work. So they had one like head coach. Hmm. And then, yeah, they had the rotating That's managers. Right. They right. tried all these, th- nothing worked. I mean, none of And I think it was after all that 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 was when they brought DeRocher. It was after this series of fiascos with the right. College of Coaches. Right. And the ro- they had to do something. And they brought in one of the biggest names in baseball. Sure. They brought in DeRocher. Was and he had, almost won the pennant. And they had another one after that. What they call him, Lowry, Peanuts Lowry? Peanuts Lowry. Yeah, yeah. He did pretty good, didn't he, for a couple of years? Uh, I don't. I remember Peanuts Lowry as a name, but I, I don't recall. You know, I, I can't right. tell you, you, know, you know, how he fit in. Derosier, the first season that Derosier had them, I think they were, they wound up in last place. The Cubs were people think that was not his first year, the year that they almost won the pennant. That was his second. Came year. out of '65, I want to say '65. I think 66. his first season was '67. I, I'm going to guess it was 67, and they finished in last place, which they'd always been a second division team. I don't think they'd ever finished in last place before. And DeRocher said that, he said, I, I said this was not an, he said something along the lines of, I said that the Cubs are not a sixth place ball club, and I proved it. I made them, a, I made, this is before <laughs> divisions. He's, I made them an eighth place right. ball club. But the next year, they almost won the, that was 68, yeah. that they almost yeah, right. won the pennant. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. was, was that the one where, or was it 69? I'm not, I think it may have been 69. 69. Yeah, 69. Ron Sandow was aboard 69. Then, of course. Well, I think was 68 then there was, was the year they, they finished in last place. fan interference or something because it was like two outs? No, that sounds like we're back to the uh, early playoff. No, I'm, I'm not sure what, what do you Well, the fan interference thing. You're not then talking what, about Barfman. Like, Bart, yeah. Bartman or you know, yeah, a little later. Well, that, that's that's yeah. that's more recently. That's that's in our They they were the kid that one, caught the ball. One game at one run ahead. Or something uh, like that, and we were on we their blew way. it, and it, we they on. had to go into an extra inning. Like three runs ahead of one. Yeah, that's that's, that's and then yeah. they lost it. Yeah, that's that's that's. <sighs> John, do you remember if uh, Derosha was fired right after the '69 season? No, no, he stayed with them. He he left in like '72 or three. really? Oh yeah, that I forgot. Well, he was with them for. They, they never they never won a pennant, and I think sure. there, there's this sense that that he. I mean, I always felt God. But they were in the they were in the mix. I mean, even in those years, they didn't. They were at least they were they were a contending team yeah, under Derosier, which is important. And sure. they had and everybody got it was like, well, you hadn't won the pennant. Well, they got rid of Derosier, and they didn't win the they didn't win the no. pennant again in the seventies or the eighties <laughs> or the nineties. When the Cubs and the Sox were doing that, that made as far as I'm concerned, the summer is a lot more interesting when, when the baseball teams were in yeah. in the season yeah. or in the contention. And this the last one, man, people were going crazy. You know, before we before we're we're coming up, it's going to be just a few minutes before we bring our show to a close. I want I want to do something that I usually do in the early in the season, usually at the beginning of the baseball season. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always consider it. It's under my contract that I get to do this once a year, uh-huh. and, and John can check it. It's in my contract with the network. Uh, in 1908, a songwriter named Jack Norwood was riding the subway in New York City. And he looked out at one of the stops and he saw a sign that said, Baseball Today, Polo Grounds. That's all it said, Baseball Today, Polo Grounds. The Polo Grounds were the park of the New York Giants. Giants. Mm. And at this time, New York City had three, count them, three ball clubs. They had the New York Yankees, who played at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. Right. They had the Brooklyn Dodgers, who, which played in Ebbets Field in right. Brookfield, which had been a Brooklyn. separate city. Yeah. When the team was set up, Brooklyn was still a separate city. Right. Yep. It had been amalgamated into, into New York, I think, in 1898. But they right. kept the name the Brooklyn Dodgers. Here come the Brooks. And they had the New York Giants, who played on the island of Manhattan right. in, in uh, the Polo Grounds. Polo grounds. Every, so there were, New York has five boroughs, and each, each of the clo- each right. of these teams was in a separate borough. Well, Jack Norwood saw this sign, and so he wrote a song. And most people, I call the song our fifth national anthem. After the Star-Spangled Banner, God Bless America, 
America the Beautiful and My Country Tis of Thee. I call it our fifth national anthem. But many people don't know the the intro to the song. Songs in those days had, I'm not sure what the technical term is for mm. it, but they had the intro, and then they had the chorus, which everybody, everybody knows, knows what, right. and everybody knows the chorus. And it's part of my contract that I get to sing this every year. And so we're heading into the World Series. We're in the playoff season now. So before this show comes to an end, we're talking about sports championships. Let me give you my rendition of Jack Norwood's song. And it goes, Nellie Kelly loved baseball games, knew the players, knew all their names. You could see her there every day, shout hooray when they play her boyfriend by the name of joe said to coney isle dear let's go then nelly started to fret and pout and that's when i heard her shout oh take me out to the ball game take me out to the park Buy me some peanut and cracker, Jack. I don't care if I never get back. Let me root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes. You're out at the old ball game. Here, here. Thank you. You, you Our talk, radio group boy uses that as a lead-in song for who's on first. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Uh, but I, and there's always a little debate, but I think most I've seen, take me out to the ball game, take me out with the crowd. And, uh, I, uh, th- th- Not take me out to the crowd, which I think most people tend to and, say. And I, I, my, I always saw it as take me out to the park. Whatever well, the park part, I'll make sure look that up again. Oh, see, that some, makes sense uh, too. He did Take two me out in- to the park. The intro that I yeah. just gave you is is the nineteen twenty seven rewrite. The original oh. intro he changed. The name of the girl was different. He had a few words in there that had fallen out of use by the nineteen twenties, and they kind of updated it. It's the version. If you ever see him, there's a movie called Take Me Out to the Ball Game, starring. Uh, Gene Kelly and Frank Sinatra as a couple of ball players, and mm-hmm. they sing this song with the intro, which is the first time I ever heard it, and I love the intro. The interesting little uh, fact is that Jack Norwood had never been to a ball game <laughs> in his life, <laughs> and he writes this song that becomes the anthem of baseball, and as I call it, our fifth national anthem. He was later recognized, he was given a gold pass later that it entitled him to visit any ballpark at any time, free of charge, for what he had done for the game. But it was only, I think, in the 1930s that it be, they began singing the, thing, the, the, the song at the park. And, of course, now, I think mm. just about everybody at, at the seventh inning stretch, everybody now yep. sings Take yep. Me right. Out to the That's become standard right. in American baseball. But it all goes back to a, a songwriter, you know, from, they called him Tin Pan Alley in those days right. in New York, and he was writing the subway. And the, 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 bega- the moral of it is it's about a girl who wants to go to the ballpark. She doesn't want to go to Coney Island with her boyfriend. Right. She She's saying, take me out to the right. ball game. Yeah. I don't want to go to Coney Island. Right. I want to see the ballgame. We never hear ball that game. beginning of it. Yeah. And you don't know, you don't yeah. know what, the, what the meaning of why right. she's saying, take me out to the ball but game. But I like the interpretation of take me out to the park. Yeah, right. that's the version right. I've always no, Nobody ever says park anymore. Take I've heard that. See, yeah, yeah, I know. Right. I'll have to check the, but my, right. the version yeah. that yeah. I had, take me out to the park. Yeah. Yeah. And something completely yeah. different. They talk about Cracker Jack. That was, from what I understand, yeah. introduced <laughs> at the Columbian Exposition. Right, it was a relatively new yeah. thing in you 1908. You know what eight. Jack's n- na- dog's name is? Not off the top. I'm probably, I'm sure I've probably heard it. Bingo. I yeah, I'm okay. Bingo, okay. Gee, I associate that with another game. Oh. <laughs> Cracker Jack, yeah. I don't know why they call him Cracker Jack unless they figured Aren't back then they ate a lot of crackers. Because there are no crackers in Cracker Pretty Jack. Yeah, but, well, it's like, you know, <laughs> post-grape nuts. It makes no sense yeah. because there are no grapes <laughs> and, and there are no nuts. <laughs> right. And that's one of the most, that's one of the oldest, it goes back to the oh, 1920s yeah. or there about. Right. I mean, that's old as shredded wheat, but it's, it's grape in that range. Nuts. Yeah, yeah, well, I remember yeah. the first time I got it, I thought, there's no grapes in it. <laughs> where are the grapes and where are the nuts? But I always loved it, though. Nice, crunchy, a distinctive nice crunchy taste. Cereal, yeah. I think they do shred wheat, though. Shredded wheat really is shredded wheat. Yeah, right. 
and they but, don't put anything in it anymore. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. one of the few ones, if any, that they you don't put You can still buy in. straight. You can buy it. You can buy a sugar coated. Yeah, wheat. you can, but you no, can get sugar it straight coated. too. But yeah. those little shredded wheat. Well, corn flakes go way back too, but they're probably adding more That's and more. That's right. A lot of sugar yeah. in corn yeah. flakes. Grape nuts, I think, is one of. I mean, uh, corn flakes are about. The, I think it maybe the puff, first package rice. Cereal. That is terrible. It is <laughs> terrible. Quaker people are not going to like you. <laughs> I always like puffed wheat. Shot from puffed guns. Puffed wheat is it was, a Remember as a kid seeing those cannons? Remember they get burned sure. they have those cannons right. firing the Shot from wheat. guns, whatever they used Shot to say. Shot from yeah. guns, yeah. I, I remember it as a kid, but I, I tried some because it doesn't have sugar in it. Yeah. Well, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, we're coming we're coming oh, up on right. our the, the clock on the wall oh, is the God, old broadcast. The clock on the wall says we're coming up. We hope you've enjoyed our trip down memory lane uh, today. We uh, We wish our... I'm here substituting. This is John Escachoco. I've been your substitute and guest moderator today in the absence of Jack Red. It's not his politics, Ryan. <laughs> uh, we've covered the horizon. We talked about the Knights of Columbus and about World War II and about old-time radio and television and news broadcasting. And we did spend our final 30 minutes talking about... In our champ- own way, we covered sports. That's, that's right. And, and for what I say, the most important of all sports, the greatest game ever devised by that's man, right. our national pastime, that's the right. great <laughs> game of baseball. May it ever shine and endure. So I'm John Escachoco. We've been joined today by... I'm Peter. And our announcer... Your announcer, Rich Lang. So we wish you a very happy Halloween. We've just finished Columbus Day. We'll be back in the middle of November in time to wish you a happy Thanksgiving and the 100th uh, let me close the 100th Armistice Day the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day is coming up November the 11th the anniversary of the 11th hour the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918 That's amazing. 100 years after the end of World War One, when the Great War came to an end so we'll talk about that at greater length next month I'm that sure we should right. do we'll yeah. honor our yeah. veterans yeah. that's gonna be one of our themes is honoring our veterans and particularly the Doughboys of 1918 who were fighting in the Argonne Forest a hundred years ago this month. Rich, our announcer? Mm-hmm. We wish to thank Kevin of Jack FM, WRHS 89.7 FM, for broadcasting our shows over the Ridgewood Radio Network. Recordings of previous Meet the Chicago Historians programs are available for your listening pleasure via the Internet at... Uh, www.windycityhometown.com On behalf of everyone associated with our Historians program, we thank you for listening. This is your announcer, Rich Lane. So long, until next time. You have been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, October the 15th, the year 2018. This broadcast was produced by Jack Ryan, directed by John DeVita, and our special thanks to our executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John Chicondo. This broadcast was pre-recorded on Monday, October the 15th, the year 2018. Until next time, friends, please be safe and thanks for listening.